Test, test, check, one, two. Hey guys, how's it going? All right. Okay, let me get the... I need to turn down my music. It's way too loud. All right. So uh, we're gonna do we're gonna do an implementation of Minwise Repro in TKOFuzz. I'm gonna talk about that in a second. I'm just gonna post on Twitter that I'm going live here. Uh, I'm training up on my, uh, I'm going to quickly grab a wolf for my training while I wait for people to show up. And then uh, we're going to hop over and do some dev. So it's been a while since I've done a, a dev stream. Um, I'm pretty stoked. I've been, I've been working on this min repro for, for a couple weeks now, on and off. Uh, and it's basically ready, so uh, today should be the day that everything works, in theory. Uh, but we don't actually know if that's going to happen. So we'll see. I'm guessing it's going to be about four to five hours of dev. Um, but it's kind of always hard to eyeball that and get a good idea of how long it will actually take. So I'm sure we're going to run into some hiccups. Uh, but most of the hard part of the development has already been done. So just waiting on this wolf. And we'll get into it. All right. Getting this wolf up here. I'm just training. I pretty much always am training on the server. I'm trying to get the trying to get the best weapon skills on the server. All right. And we should be good. All right. Back to dev. Okay, so min repro is basically this concept in TKO fuzz. So uh, the snapshots that we're looking at here are typically relatively large. So we have, in this case, I'm looking at this uh, snap.mem and the snap.state. So snap.mem contains all of the uh, virtual memory that is used by the box process. And that basically contains everything that it, that contains the uh, virtual machines memory, that contains boxes device state, that contains uh, random allocated things in box. And then we have snap.state, and this has like differences uh, that are made on files on disk. So for example, if you were to write a file in Windows in the guest, uh, that would end up going to snap.state rather than actually going out to disk. Because in TKO fuzz, we don't want to modify anything on disk. All of the things from the snapshot were, are used um, uh, completely read-only. So that allows us to keep rerunning it, and we don't have a different behavior every time we run. So in TKO fuzz, uh, this snapshot in this case is, is 2 gigs here for the memory. 24k for the uh, state file and but uh, it gets kind of gross when we look at the fake FS and this contains the um, the box version of that snapshot so in this case this has a 15 gig disk um, which is on kind of the small side for Windows so if I wanted to find it if I found a crash in this build of Windows or whatever I'm fuzzing, and I wanted to give this off to a developer for the developer to reproduce that that bug, um, I would have to give them this whole folder, uh, which would include a 15 gig hard drive, and then I'd have to give them the uh, two gig memory file, and now I'm sending a developer 18 gigs. And in a lot of situations, that could be a pretty large amount of uh, 
data, uh, especially if maybe the developer doesn't have a good internet connection, maybe they're working remote and they only have 20 megabit, uh, you might be talking serious, serious time uh, to get that to work. So what I've done is I've instrumented everything inside of uh, TKO Fuzz, where pages are paged in and where sectors are read from the disk. So if we take a look at TKO, um, we should have a page, uh, page in handler here. And this page in handler is kind of the core of the internals of TKO. So I recently changed uh, how TKO works internally before it used to use like a, a shared file that was mapped copy and write from disk and that would be kind of the whole memory backing for um you know let me rewind and talk a little bit more about some of the internals of tko fuzz so tko fuzz at its heart is built upon box and if i grab a tab um, we can go look at Box, and Box is an emulator. I know that I have it set for scaling on a different monitor. So Box is a 30, uh, x86, uh, both Intel and AMD uh, emulator, and that's kind of the core of what we're relying on for processor and device emulation, and that's really cool. There's a new Box release that just came out. Um, some AVX 512 implementation, EPT based sub page, new uh, processor models. Okay, that's really cool. So I'm going to send this as a note to some coworkers because um, we're going to want to update our internal box to this. Uh, the last box release. So you might be thinking, what's the big deal with uh, box coming out? Uh, one second, I'm going to just do this quick. Uh, doop. Uh, what's the big deal with, uh, with a new box coming out? I just have this hidden because the Teams app was going to pop up on the screen. So I think we're good now. Okay. Okay. So for some reason, this is really buggy. The, the Teams app on Linux is really buggy. It actually just came out. Um, okay. So the last release of Box was in 2017. So this is actually a pretty big deal that this just came out. Um, I'm actually really excited to look into this. It's about three years of development that has gone into a box since that last release. So I'm excited to look into what this changed. So let me, I'm going to post this in my teams and make sure that we get things brought up to speed. Um, here we go. So box 2.6.10 just came out a week ago. We should update. Okay. All right, so the internals of, of TKO are basically based on Box. And we picked Box because Box allows us to emulate. Oh, I don't have my webcam on. OK, there you go. Hey, everyone. Um, so Box basically uh, is the core of TKO for x86 emulation and device emulation. And the reason we picked Box instead of QMU is because Box supports emulating a lot of processors uh, based on kind of the model of the processor. So you're able to kind of specify different types of processor, whether you want Skylake, whether you want some old Pentium 2 processor, and it will emulate all the CPU ID flags and all of the differences between those. Um, further, Box implements things like AVX 512 emulation. It implements uh, VTX emulation, VTD emulation. Uh, it also implements AMD's SVM. That's their hypervisor uh, hardware acceleration um, for AMD. And what that allows us to do is we can run things like Zen or KVM or Hyper-V or VirtualBox or whatever we want inside of Box. And since we're able to do that, we can then fuzz virtual machines fully deterministically with repro and coverage and feedback and snapshot fuzzing and all the bells and whistles of that we kind of provide in the snapshot fuzzing environment. Um, typically, it's very, very hard to fuzz hypervisors. And this makes TKO probably one of the very few things that has full coverage um, of hypervisor fuzzing and probably is the only thing out there with fully deterministic uh, hypervisor fuzzing. So one of the issues that we had with Box was that Box was proven to not be deterministic. Um, we did a couple tests on Box where I would basically take two different VMs and I would run them uh, side by side in parallel. So I would load up a snapshot in Box in one Box instance, and then I'd load up another snapshot in another instance of Box, same version of Box, exact same snapshot, and then I would have them run together and use a named pipe to communicate the register states uh, that they were observing along the way. 
Um, and a couple million instructions in, there was already divergence where there were different register states, uh, which made me really concerned. Uh, we looked into a lot of configurables inside of Box. You can kind of change whether the real-time clock gives a real time or whether it gives like a fake time that's based on number of cycles and based on kind of a bunch of other things that have happened since uh, boot. Um, so we switched to all of the deterministic settings, and we still didn't get determinism. Uh, and we looked into it. We fixed a couple of the determinism bugs, um, but that didn't give us 100% confidence. So while we fixed all the bugs that we knew of, that doesn't mean we fixed bugs that we didn't know of. And the performance hit of this stepping side by side with a pipe uh, was too large that we can't actually run the standard fuzzing environment. Um, in that mode. And that means that there could be something 10 billion instructions into execution that is non deterministic, and we'd never be able to catch that because we would not be running in this pipe mode during that fuzz case or that situation where the non determinism happened. Um, so that led to kind of an interesting concept. How do we get full determinism out of box? Uh, we could either go down the route of really, really getting into how Box works and understanding very thoroughly kind of the different behaviors of Box, uh, but that is really tough. As, as you might imagine, uh, we would have to be basically like core developers of Box with almost full knowledge of all of the interactions, all the timers, all the interconnects of everything in there. Um, and while that doesn't sound too difficult in terms of like, oh, you can get to know it here or there, uh, actually understanding it fully to be confident in saying these bugs will reproduce, it is worth giving these bugs to developers who are going to spend tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of dollars of time looking into these crashes, uh, we're going to be confident that they're not wasting their time. And we couldn't really do that with, with fixing box. Um, so we went with a different approach that I called Franzia. And Franzia was this theory that we could write a, we could build box uh, with a, as like a static library, or a static binary. So in this case, uh, we have the box, uh, should have a box copy somewhere in here. Um, Cargo run update, maybe I don't. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe I deleted the box, but whatever. So we built a statically compiled version of Box using a custom Musil toolchain. And that Musil toolchain, which is our libc, uh, we also pulled in lib standard C++ from the GNU project. Um, and basically what we did is we modified everything inside of libc to instead of doing syscalls, invoking the syscall instruction that breaks into the OS uh, that we don't have control over, uh, we changed all of those instances of syscalls, which was honestly like a, a couple of patches. It's like the patches we have uh, for Musil, here they are. Um, actually, I'll open them in Vim so we can get some coloring. So here we added some stuff that like detects whether we're running in this Franzia mode. We added... Uh, uh, when we try to get access to uh, pthread self, which is uh, a thread local, instead we have access to some structure. So basically, we don't want this box, this compiled version of box, to have access to FS, GS, or syscalls, um, or RDRAs, CPUID, uh, like all of these different entropy gathering things that would allow it to kind of break out of the sandbox. So we modified this version of Musil, and we just had to change a couple places, uh, 270 lines of diffs, um, and that has like a bunch of these headers. It, it's, it took a day, okay? It took a day to go from downloading Musil and trying out libc's to actually getting a version of Musil working that would, instead of doing syscalls, would in, uh, just do a call instruction to us. And what that allows us to do is in this Unix emulator, um, all we do is I implement a way of, let me see if, might be in fake VM for uh, kind of the internals. So fake VM is kind of the lowest level part of TKO fuzz. And fake VM is basically a user land uh, context switching primitive. It's very similar to like a context switch that you would implement in like an OS development course. Um, and what this does is fake VM contains an X save state for the guest. Um, or the xsave type, uh, so we can mux the different types of xsaves. So we have all the guest GPRs, the standard racks through R15, RIP, and R flags. 
Um, we have the X save state of the guest, and then we have the host GPRs and X save state. And this allows us to transition uh, into the guest by saving the host to the host state, and then loading up the guest state, and then vice versa when we actually go to exit the VM. Um, we also have this memory region, and we're going to go into that in a minute. So with this fake VM, all we do is we just load up, uh, like when someone says, I want a new fake VM, you say the base that you would like the memory to be loaded at. Um, if you say none, obviously it puts it somewhere else. Otherwise, you can specifically specify where you want this to be loaded. Uh, you pass it a fault handler for what should happen if a fault occurs in this area of the VM. And then you also pass it a context that's just an any type. And that allows you to have some context that gets past your fault handler. So you can kind of get access to yourself or your structure or whatever you want uh, to have uh, when a fault happens. So it's pretty straightforward. We build this MageWeb MMU. Once again, going to go into that in a bit. We make a fake VM that's empty. Uh, we add this entire memory range. This is a physical memory allocator. Technically, everything here is in virtual memory, but this is effectively a physical memory allocator. Um, it, it's very much so like we made an operating system in userland, uh, which is which is kind of fun. Um, we set up the uh, FPCW and MXCSR. Those are the like control registers for. Uh, for floating point and MMX state. Uh, so we set these to like fixed states because once again, we want determinism. Um, we check for some features. We assert if the FXCSR is there, if it's not, or FXSR. If that's not there, I, I don't know what's happening because you're running a 64-bit thing without floating point, uh, which is impossible. And then here we detect whether we have Xsave, um, and if we have Xsave, we use Xsave. If we have Xsave op, then we use Xsave op. Uh, you'll see that we have an if false here, and that is to disable all of that. So basically, Xsave and Xsave op would make these keyframes uh, fundamentally tied to a specific microarchitecture due to the uh, undefined shape of these structures. Technically, it's defined by a CPU ID, but uh, you could have different states for different processors. So instead, we just fall back on only having FXSR support, and that means that we're only able to save and restore SSE state. So the target that we run in this environment is only allowed to do SSE uh, instructions. It cannot do AVX, it can't do AVX 512, um, but I've verified that none of those instructions are used, so that's fine. We've, we've made that safe. Um, then we implement a, a couple other things in here. We have an elf loader, um, and this is really straightforward. You just say, I want to load an elf at this base, and you give it a file, and then it loads that into the memory of this fake VM, and then also sets uh, the RIP to be the entry point for the elf. So uh, all we have to do to get an application running in this environment is we just call uh, fake VM new, make some memory, have some size bytes for the size of memory, maybe set a base, give a fault handler and a context. Um, and then we just put, uh, then we just call uh, add stack. Obviously we need to add a stack and that will set up a stack and, and put RSP pointing to the top of the stack. And then we can also add an elf to this, uh, to this, space and that will set RIP to the entry point of the elf and then from that point I think we just have a run yeah right here so we just do run and runs pretty straightforward that's going to set up this trampoline and the trampoline has all of the pointers uh, to these different uh, required states that we have so the guest GPRs and xsave and host GPRs and xsave uh, it has access to this context switch routine that we'll go into in a second. Um, but basically, all of those things, this trampoline is record C, which means that we can access it from assembly because we know the shape of the structure. So if we look into uh, shared fake VM source uh, trampolines, and here, this is where we implement our different context switches. So when you do get context switch routine, this will get the correct context switch routine depending on your Xsave state or the Xsave type that is allowed. Uh, obviously, in all cases, uh, since we disabled that check, uh, we'll only use FX safe, but I kind of keep the other stuff around just in case we want to adopt this for other uses. Okay, so then we have the context switch. It's pretty straightforward. It's just uh, it's like 50 lines of assembly. Um, what we do is we save off some registers here that we're going to use as scratch registers. So at this point, uh, when we enter this function, we have to make sure that all of the guest state and host state are saved or loaded for all registers, including flags and RIP. All of those things are saved and, and 
restored. So we kind of have to be careful here with what, how we save and restore these things to make sure that we don't clobber any registers. So in this case, I push R10 through R13 so I can use this for scratch. I push the flags, and then I load R10 through R13 with some of the different contexts from the trampolines. In this case, I'm getting access to the save GPRs and the restore GPRs. Um, then here, I'm going to save all the GPRs. Uh, obviously, I'm not saving R10 through R13 yet. Then I'm going to pop R flags into the correct spot in the save state, and then I'm going to pop R13 through R10 into those registers. So now I've saved all of the running state right now. Uh, as of when this function was entered, I saved all the state for all GPRs, R flags, and RIP. Um, then I kind of just do the obverse, uh, and I, well, here I uh, use the save instruction. That's a macro to pick whether I use FX save or X save or all these different options I have. Um, and at that point, all the stuff has been there, and then I'm going to restore, and now we're going from the guest state. I'm going to restore all these GPRs. I'm going to push the R flags. I'm going to push RIP. Um, and I'm going to restore R12. And then I'm going to ret. So you might be wondering, how do I get execution control here? Well, it's through this push and uh, ret. So this push is pushing the RIP. And then this ret is going to cause us to return into the guest, even though ret normally returns out of something. We're actually using ret here as a long jump. Um, and the reason we do that instead of using like a jump uh, register is a jump register would require that one of our GPRs contains RIP's target value. And I want to have control of every single register when we enter this guest state. Um, so that's that's what we did. We, we use a push and a ret instead. So that's pretty straightforward, uh, really simple, but that allows us to run kind of an isolated environment in user land. Obviously, there's no security isolation there because the guest can modify all the host memory. But for the if the guest is well behaving, in this case, we're emulating box. We're not emulating a hostile process that's that's like we're not using this to contain malware. This isn't an actual sandbox, uh, but what it does is it provides a different operating environment for um, this executable. In this case, specifically for Box. Okay, so once we have that fake VM set up, then what will happen is the um, the custom Musil that we built uh, is going to make calls into into us when it wants to do a syscall. So what we can look at is uh, in UnixMU, we have a bunch of syscall handlers. So here we have run. This is going to run, and basically running will run forever until there's an exit code. Um, and when run returns, that means a syscall occurred. There's no other way that you can return from this guest environment except for a syscall. Um, so then we have handle syscall here, straightforward. We just have syscall handlers for all the different syscalls that we need for boxes, you know, whatever box uses. Um, and it's super straightforward. We just go and implement these. And it's, it's about uh, 2,000 lines of code for this entire thing that has socket support. It has support for... Um, Net, uh, yeah, it has support for UDP TCP networking. It has support for opening files and mapping things, uh, allocating more things in your data section, uh, a couple different signal related things, um, obviously getting times and all of that. So now that we have this box instance running in this contained environment where we handle all the syscalls, uh, first of all, we can now run this box on Windows or Linux or FreeBSD or Mac OS X or Solaris. It doesn't matter because we're implementing everything in um, entirely in this kind of emulated layer. So if we take a look at things that can cause entropy to happen, uh, uh, not set i timer. That's not a good good one. Uh, we'll look at clock get time. So clock get time, uh, we implement by um, just incrementing something by I think like a millisecond. Yeah. We advance time by a millisecond. So every time you call clock get time, you just get one millisecond further. There you go. Now it's deterministic. Now Box has no access to entropy. And Box has been made fully deterministic with 100% confidence. Um, and we don't have to worry about anything. So there we go. Now Box is deterministic. So that's kind of the fundamental uh, premise of TKO fuzz and how it works internally. 
Um, we just kind of have this fake environment where we let box run and execute and do its stuff. Okay. So that leads to MageWeave MMU. MageWeave MMU is a user land kind of exception handler that allows us to uh, create memory that looks very similar to Unix state because a lot of the things are passed through. Um, this you're going to give a base for this memory region. You're going to give it a number of elements. It's templated, so it can be any type. Um, then a fault handler for what happens when faults occur here, and then a context for passing the handler function. And what that's going to do is that's going to allocate um, that's going to allocate a region that is just reserved. Um, so that's going to be reserved uh, like on Windows. That's going to call um, that's going to call uh, 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 virtual alloc, and that's going to pass mem reserve, and it won't pass mem commit. And then on Linux, that's going to pass in. Um, I think it just pass in zero for the permissions for that for that region of memory, and that allows the operating system to reserve that region of virtual memory, but not actually commit any pages to it, because we only want to pull things in as they're used by the virtual machine. Otherwise, it's going to get really expensive. So if I take a look at um, what we do in Franzia then, or in, in TKO, um, here we have this fault handler, this page and handler. And this is called directly by the MageWeave MMU for the underlying memory that Box is using. And in this case, it says, hey, I got a fault. Uh, something was trying to access this virtual address. Uh, this is the offset from the base of wherever the region is that you allocated. And then here's your any type, that, that context. So here we convert the any type to the type that we're expecting. Um, obviously, it's impossible for that to be another type, so we panic if it's not that type. Um, we borrow that ref cell, so we get intermutability to this memory backing structure. And then here, we determine how we want to page in that memory. So at this point, there is no memory for this box process, and we want to figure out how we want to page these things in. So if there's no memory backing type, we page in zeros. That's kind of the default behavior of virtual alloc and mmap on Windows, where things will get faulted in with zeros. Um, if we're backing the keyframe by a file, so for example, if we're running in this local mode, where we actually are opening and seeking and reading this, uh, this snap.mem right here, then what we'll do is we'll call uh, get page on this MMU file, mage we have MMU file, that's MMUF, um, and we're just going to get that page. If the page doesn't exist in that file, then we'll return out zeros, uh, like is expected in an MMAP or virtual alloc. And then in server mode, that is what happens if we're running uh, TKO fuzz over the network. So uh, in TKO fuzz, you can spin up a server instance, and then you can have clients connect in, and they'll download pages as they're accessed. So that way, you can get a 32 gig snapshot up and running over the network instantaneously, because it faults in pages directly over the network. And that's implemented here. It's very straightforward. We get access to shared memory. We then check whether or not this virtual address is in the page cache. So basically, whether we've downloaded this uh, on like another thread working on this process, uh, working on the same snapshot. Um, if it is in the cache, we just return that out, and that, that will get paged in, and then we'll write in those bytes to that memory. Otherwise, if that fails, uh, we're going to request the page from the server. So Brawler is our, our server, like client server protocol that we implement in TKO. Um, we try and get access to that page. If the page doesn't exist, then we will return out zeros once again. We'll then allocate uh, an entry in the, um, the hash table of this uh, page cache, and we'll fill that in. And then finally, we'll return out the page. And that's it. So that's really straightforward, but it means that we get to see all the pages in flight as they're faulted in uh, that are performed by box. And that leads us to an interesting property, is when we're going through to reproduce a bug that we found or a crash that we found, th that allows us to see everything that's used during the reproducing of that bug. Um, so what we can then do, very simply, is we can just log those pages. We can create a log of all the pages and the page's contents uh, for all the pages as they fly by. So we're kind of like watching all the pages fill in, and we can log what those pages were in terms of the virtual addresses and then the contents of those pages at their, as they're loaded. Um, and that's that's it. It's, it's as simple as that. So um, 
we log all the pages that we have, and that allows us to have a minimal set of all of the pages that are ever read from during a fuzz case to hit a specific crash. And now we no longer need the entire memory file. We can simply provide this file because since everything is deterministic in TKO fuzz, we're able to give simply these diffs. We're able to give only the pages that have actually been touched. Um, so that's what we're working on. So I built a, uh, I made a little graph here. So I think I have, yeah. Um, so I made a graph here, and this is basically the, um, this is Windows running over time. It's a log scale on the x-axis. Um, love my, my log scales. And then on the y-axis is the number of megabytes in the minimum repro file. So this is showing, um, Basically that after one second of running, Windows has uniquely paged in or uniquely used about, let's say, 40 megs of memory. Um, but it's kind of a, it's, it's slightly above, um, or it's slightly under linear, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, since this is log scale, it looks exponential, but it's uh, actually, it's slightly above linear, I'm guessing. Um, anyways. Uh, so about 10 seconds in, we're up to like 120 megs, and then, what is this? This is 400 seconds in, it's up to like 450 megs. So that means if you were to have a 400 second, almost a 10 minute long fuzz case, uh, it's likely that your minimum repro file to reproduce that, that crash, including the you know, 32 gigs of disk that you have and the 8 gigs of RAM that you have mapped in for Windows, um, you're only looking at about 450 megs that you have to give to a developer to reproduce it in an environment where they can single step and trace and put breakpoints on things, uh, which is amazing. Uh, it's a very, very, very lightweight, reduced down copy. So, um, there are a couple other things that we have to log in MinRepro. So if I take a look, I, I made a MinRepro crate, uh, or a MinRepro library more specifically in this case. And this MinRepro library is, is responsible for holding all of the data that is ever used uh, in this MinRepro. So we're going to log this state file. I haven't done that yet. Uh, I log all the file contents. That was kind of the hard part. Surprisingly, logging memory was really simple because I designed MageWeb MMU to support MinRepro when I got to it. Um, and then I record some statistics, and that's how I was able to generate that graph. Um, so this is pretty straightforward. When I go to log page, all I do is I, uh, first of all, I, I assert that the address is page aligned. That's a requirement for calling this function. Um, then I log the page, and the way that I do that is I, in, inside of this minrepro structure, I create a new entry in this uh, memory contents hash table with this virtual address and then a copy of the page contents. Um, and that's it. It's as simple as that. Um, I then assert that that didn't exist in the table before. It should be impossible for the same page to get paged in twice. Obviously, since it's already paged in the first time, uh, there's nothing to page in the second time, so that wouldn't happen. So I like to assert in cases where I know that it should be the first and only time ever inserted into a database, I make, to, I make sure to assert that assumption. Because uh, if that were violated, then there might be some weird situation that something's getting paged in twice and I'm not sure why, and that would likely be a bug in itself. Um, so uh, be pedantic with your asserts. I think, I think it's really useful to do that. Um, then I log statistics of the number of bytes that are um, tracked for pages in this min repro. And then I have this debug min repro, which I currently have running, actually. Um, and this just allows it to print some stuff to the screen. So this is kind of what I'm getting. I'm seeing the uptime. I'm seeing the total number of pages that have been recorded in the min repro. I see the number of bytes that are used by those pages, which is just this multiplied by 4K. Um, and then I also have file bytes. This is the number of bytes from the disk that are used. Um, so we're going to hop over there and take a look at how we do that. So that is done in uh, shared... Uh, I think this is Unix emu diff reader. Oh, fake... Uh, oh, Unix emu source diff reader. So diff reader is basically how our Unix emulator... Uh, allows things to read and write things from disk. And all it does is it handles kind of mapping things in blocks. So when uh, when the Unix guess, so in this case we're running box, when it goes to do like a read file or a map view of file, um, we'll end up, oh, there's a squirrel running around. Um, 
uh, what I'll do is there will be a read, and this read will basically take in the offset and then a buffer to contain the bytes as they're read. And what this will do is it will figure out if it's a special file, we'll pan it because we shouldn't have reads on special files. Um, then we're going to check the maximum number of bytes we can read based on the size of the file. We're going to check if it's disk backed. If it's disk backed and we haven't opened the file yet, then we're going to open the file. Um, we're going to go down kind of further. We're going to then figure out, uh, we're going to loop around. We're going to do everything kind of blocked. So everything is based on blocks because we're going to have uh, diffing on these environments. So this will allow us to... Um, this will allow us to make changes to something on disk, but only persist that in memory in a deterministic way. Um, so we want to avoid, um, one second, I'm doing something on the other screen, sorry. Okay. So we want to, um, we want these changes that happen to disk to not actually get flushed out, flushed out to disk. So if we have this in the diffs, then we're going to just grab the contents from the diff, because that's the copy we want to use. Otherwise, uh, we don't have a diff, in which case, if there is a server connection, we want to download that file from the server. And if there's not a server, then we want to download that file locally, or read the file locally, where it's, it's literally just going to seek the file and read uh, the contents for that block. Um, and that's it. And it's going to update state and, and loop until that's satisfied. And then the write does the same thing, where the write will read thing, it will get them from the network, or it will get them from the local file, and then it will apply an update to those. So in, let's look at the networking case. This is going to request a read file at this offset for a certain file name. It's then going to log that this uh, read occurred, and that's going to go to our, um, that's going to go to our, uh, um, that's going to go to our min repro state stuff. And then we're going to update that region. And you might be wondering, why are we not logging after the update? Well, we want to log all of the min repro is going to log the original contents for memory and original contents for files. We don't actually want any of the modifications because the modifications will still happen in a deterministic fashion um, when we're actually executing. So all we have to do in this uh, this min reader uh, or in this diff reader is we had to um, add these log file reads in a couple spots. I had to restructure some of this code because it wasn't quite in a shape where I could just drop that in. Um, but now that's done. So that means now anything that the uh, emulated Unix process accesses from, from disk, that will end up coming from the uh, min repro file here in this file contents. And then also the memory contents will be grabbed from this min repro file as well. So, and then the state file will just be deserialized from the original state file that is used, and that's going to be the, let's say, uh, uh, snap.state in this case. So, that's kind of where we are. Um, all I've done is the logging part of it so far. I haven't actually gone to using the contents, the file contents or the memory contents when I go to reproduce a crash. So, there are a couple things that we have to do today. So, first we have to figure out when do we want to save a min repro file. We have to create a file format for the min repro file such that we can serialize it to disk and then reload it for a subsequent run. And then finally, we have to um, actually use it. We have to go into all the places where things get paged in. And if the min repro has been specified, which is another state machine, I hate having state machines, but we're starting to have a couple now, um, then it will get it from the min repro. So uh, the first thing we're going to have to do is we're going to have to serialize that out to disk. Uh, we basically just have to do these in order. We have to first create this file, and then we're going to um, basically we're going to serialize out this structure. Um, and then we're going to just create another command line org for TKO that allows us to pass in the file name of the min repro, the serialized min repro file. And then that will allow us to continue execution from that point. All right, that makes sense to everyone. That's what we're in for. I'm hoping we're only about four hours away. Um, I suspect it's probably like one hour of dev, uh, but three hours of, of issues that we're gonna have to debug because we're gonna forget and screw up and make mistakes. Okay, so the first thing I want to do is I want to uh, remove this crashes folder. Uh, or all the contents of the crashes folder, and then I'm going to go through and disable this uh, debug min repro, this like verbose logging of min repro. 
And then this will allow us to run uh, this environment. And uh, I'm just running from this snap. And uh, I actually gave it a specific crash. Uh, failed to read the input file, of course, because I deleted all the crashes. So I'm going to do cargo run start snap. And, okay, MRIF. Uh, I did see that earlier, and it looks like I just had, like, a verbose thing there. That was, yeah, okay. So just removing that panic is fine. That was just, I was kind of confused as to why something wasn't mapped in there prior. Okay, so we should see some faults occurring here. These are just, like, uh, random uh, page faults occurring in the kernel. And I'm just going to wait for a couple interesting ones. So here we have a non-canonical axis in the kernel. Um, so what we want to do is we're going to try and use this as our kind of reproducing oracle. So this is what we're going to be working on all day today is this NCA, this non-canonical access. Uh, and here we see that the kernel, I guess I don't have the faulting address in the file name, so I don't know exactly what it's accessing. Uh, but we know that the, the kernel ends up... Um, kernel ends up accessing it, it it shouldn't, and that causes a, a non-canonical address access, which is a, a general protection fault on xd6. Non-canonical basically means that the top, so uh, virtual addresses on xd6 are 48 bits. Technically, they vary, but 48 bits for any real Intel silicon, and thus the top 16 bits have to be sign extended of the 47th zero indexed bit. Um, and if they're not, then it's a non-canonical access. So if you were to deref all four ones on 64-bit, uh, that would actually be a non-canonical access, and you wouldn't actually get a page fault for that because it, it cannot page that in. It's not a valid address for paging to, to translate. Okay. So now what I should be able to do is I can give this the NCA. Well, in this case, I'm going to give it the general protection fault that happens right afterwards. It's the same fault. Um, so this will allow me to then go through, and it's going to try and reproduce that bug. Of course, it's going to work because everything repros in TKO. And we should hopefully get a print when it hits that point. So here it says, hit icon breakpoint popping into debugger. We don't have a debugger attached, so obviously nothing popped up. So this is the location that we're going to want to save this min repro. So um, this is going to be in shared crash handler, I think. Um, uh, this is actually a plugin crash handler source. Hey, Dougum, how you doing today? Hope all is well. Oh, I forgot to play Country Roads for you when I was uh, when I was back there in in DC. I know I know that's your song of your peop the song of your people. Um, it was actually the first song that I learned on guitar, so I don't know why. But that was the first song I learned on guitar, and I was pretty happy when I when I finally like made sounds out of a guitar. So, so so yeah. All right. So we're in the crash handler. We're gonna do popping into debugger. Okay, and that was easy. Done. Um. So that. Oh, that's getting access to the KDNet plugin. The KDNet plugin is not loaded. Okay. So here we're going to um, also, uh, attempt to save off the min repro file if min repro is enabled. So here we'll just do uh, franzia.save min repro. And we'll say failed to write uh, min repro file. Okay, and I think I actually have a way of getting access to min repro. Do, 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 fn min repro dot, fn dot star min repro. Oh, maybe not. Um, set auto keyframing. Okay, I do not. So I'm going to have a way to get access to the min repro. Uh, which I think I store, I store it in a couple places because I have to, but I do store it in Frenzy Persist as a RC uh, ref cell option. Okay. So then that allows us to go to doo -doo -doo, just down here. We're going to say uh, pub fn gets min repro. 
And this is going to return uh, RC ref cell option min repro. Get access to the min repro. Actually, I'm going to just call it min repro. Uh, min repro backing for Franzia. If the min repro is uh, none, then min repro has not been enabled as a command line flag, and thus no min repro diffs are being saved. Okay, self dot per min repro dot clone. Oh, easy. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah, we call we call a function that didn't exist, and then okay. So here we're gonna get access to the min repro equals uh, franzia dot min repro, and then I'm going to make that mutable. I'm gonna say if let sum uh, min repro equals mute min, mute deref min repro uh, borrow mute. I might have to bind that to another variable. We'll see. I'm pretty sure I do. It's not going to be happy about that. Print uh, should save min repro. Okay. Yep. Makes sense. So then we're going to do let's mute. Uh, let mute min repro. It's min repro ridge. The scroll is just going crazy on my deck. <laughs> okay. So that should print. If it doesn't, I'm going to be sad. I'm actually going to put uh, dash dash quiet to turn off the, the uh, process prints and everything. How's everyone doing today? Having up to some fun stuff? All right, should save min repro, perfect. Works great, everything is awesome. So now we're gonna call min repro dot serialize. And here we gave a file name for min repro, son of a bitch, I'm gonna have to do some plumbing. Um, so I have to get this from the command line args, which I think is in main.rs. Ah, son of a bitch. Lib.rs. There it is. Create min repro. Get the value of that. Uh, we don't want if is sum. We'll just do this. Min repro. Uh, Franzia. That will take. Now that's a sum with a string. Uh, serialize, of course, is not found. We're going to comment that out temporarily. Okay. Uh, yep, 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 yep. That's going to be a none. In fact, nope, that's fine. That's actually good. Okay. Min repro expected a bool found an option of string. Okay. Um, that should be fine. We're going to just make a copy of that so we don't have to deal with lifetimes. So this is in 386. Good number. Um, FM new. Okay. Here. Track min repro. This is going to be option stir. And that's the file name. Okay. Track if track min repro dot is actually we'll do um, if let sum min repro fn is equal to track min repro then we're going to set the min repro up for that we're going to set that there and I think we're going to store the file name in here Yeah, we're going to do that in, okay. So this is going to be min repro file name, or well, <laughs> file name. Sometimes I, I do like really verbose <laughs> typing when I realize that the structure kind of implies that. I, I'm, I'm trying to get better at that. Um, file name to uh, create, file name to use when the min repro file is created. Okay, and this is going to be an optional thing. And we'll have to, we already have path buff, gorgeous, love to see that. I love when I already have things pulled in that I want. And then here we'll have pub fn at a uh, set file name p as ref path. 
mute self, file name p, and then we'll just do self dot file name equals sum file name dot as ref dot into. Set the file name to use for the min repro. Okay, and then down here, uh, min repro bar mute is that, and here we'll do min re uh, we'll actually bind that. Ah, uh, we'll do it again. Repro dot borrow mute dot set file name, and that will be min repro fn dot uh, min repro file name dot into actually we can do path new min repro fn okay and that's not fallible and we've got some print issues here there we go set file name 1495 not found on ref mute we're gonna have to deref that bad boy there we go uh, method not. F ah, yes. Um, uh, ref mute. Maybe it's as mute. Unwrap. The unwrap is fine here because we set it to true above. Actually, I'm going to do this. Let's min. Met, let's mute. Uh, new min repro. Min repro equals default. Default new min repro dot set file name path new min repro fn. Okay, cool. And then we're just going to set this instead. Okay, so this will be new min repro. So create a new empty min repro and pop populate the file name set up the min repro structure to hold this newly created min repro okay or set up the min repro ref cell okay 1500 yup and that needs to be some and we did it okay uh, we didn't quite do it. Um, 340, this is in librs. Okay, 340, these just need to be none. 519, this needs to be none. And we did it. Okay. So now we can call minrepro.serialize. Nice. Okay. And that's just in here. So hopefully we'll spend more time in here now. Pub fn serialize mute self. Actually, it doesn't need to be mutable. Serialize the current min repro to disk. Okay, print serializing to this self dot file name. Let mute file or let file name equals self dot as uh, self dot file name dot as ref dot unwrap dot expect temp to serialize a min repro without setting file name. Okay. Got the file name we should use for the for min repro. And we got the file name here. Okay, so I know this is going to work. Um, I don't know why I test things like every few lines of code that I write, but that's how I dev. It works. So that's the command line arg uh, plumb through here all the way into the internals. So now we just need to create a file format. Um, and I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to update my, uh, uh, can I put this in noodle? I can probably noodle this structure. I. We'll need to implement serialize for a couple of these things. Um, I'm just gonna manually serialize this out to disk. So uh, open the file we're serializing to, and here I'll do um, let f let mute fd equals 
file create file name. And here we're going to have this return an IO result. So now we can do that. And I just need to pull in use standard IO. Okay, IO result. This will have to return OK. And that's good. So now that will create that file. Uh, we need to pull that in as well. So we'll use use standard fs file, use standard io read, write. We'll eventually need read as well when we go to deserialize it, but we won't worry about that yet. And then result that must be used. So here we're going to say dot expect failed to serialize min repro file. Okay, perfect. So I'm also going to need to set up the state, uh, which shouldn't be too hard. So that will get... Uh, hmm. I might just make that pub. Ah, get her and set her. I think it's better here. Pub fn set state uh, mute self state. That's a slice of u8s. And self dot state equals state dot into set the state file contents for this min repro. Ah, uh, yeah. And then get the state file contents for this min repro. That will do this. Okay, and this will make pub unsafe fn. And then this one will be self.state. Put a little ampersand out there, and we should be good. Okay. So we want to make that unsafe because the um like the the act of the act of um setting that state file, the state file has like pointers in it and stuff. Um so we just mark that as unsafe. Technically, uh, technically, TKO has a lot of things that should be marked unsafe that aren't, but it's kind of hard to keep track of all that stuff when fundamentally it relies on like emulating an arbitrary process. So it's kind of gets tough on on those internals. Okay. Okay. So we've got the we set the state. We're gonna want to do that whenever we get access to the state file for the first time. Um, I think I might have a way of doing that. Ah, uh, get state, ah. Uh. States. So I want this to work over the network as well. Um, this will allow you to drop a min repro file from a network run thing. So I just need to make sure I can get the state file correctly. And I feel like I cached that. I totally cached that. Uh, guest state. Uh, I totally saved that somewhere. Right. Uh, load keyframe. Okay, load keyframe. That's gonna go into here. If it's the server, it's gonna get the keyframe state. Then it's gonna do this. Then it's gonna. Is that checking in every time. Get keyframe. I guess so. So when a keyframe is loaded, at this point, this has the state. So I should have the serialized buff here. Um, okay. So then I'll do if let sum uh, min repro is equal to self dot persist dot min repro dot borrow mute and then a uh, little bit of this bad boy. Okay, it might not like that. Nice. Okay, it does a lot of that. Nice. I didn't know if that would expire, so this will be um, establish the state 
uh, contents in the min repro. Repro. Okay, so here we'll do uh, self dot. So uh, min repro dot set on safe set whatever we call that function already forgot. I think set state file or probably something like that. Yep, set state. Set state to serialize buff. Okay, so that should be plumbed through there. So now that will get access to that. Okay. Whew, we're almost there. Nice. Okay. So that worked. Well, I should. It should. It should have worked. Uh, so now we're gonna serialize this. So we're gonna create uh, kind of a file structure for this. We're gonna do um, const min repro version id. This will be a u64, and this will be a import random import random pyth uh, hex random dot rand int zero two to the sixty four minus one. That's our number. Okay. Uh, version identifier for this version of min repro files. And then we'll do fd.write exact. And then we'll pass this a reference to this, oops, whatever we called this thing, min repro version ID. Um, this dot two le bytes uh, writes out the file header. All right, nice. Uh, not found an FS, fs file. Write all. Okay. Question mark. Write out the file header. So now we have version controlling of these right off the bat. Okay. And then I just need to serialize out the rest of the structure. So we'll actually split this window so we can have a look at the structure shape while we're serializing it out. So all we're going to do is just kind of go down the list. We don't need to serialize the file name, of course. So we'll do um, fd.write all... Uh, Self.state.len as u64. Dot to le bytes. And then fd.write all self.state. Okay, write out the state. And then we'll do fd. Uh, okay, fd.write all self dot file con oops okay so um do 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 do, do. where's that oh, I was down here no I was at serialize oh that completely screwed it up okay there we go serialize um this is file contents dot len as u64.2 le bytes and then fd dot write all uh, okay write out number of uh, files for file name file contents in file name dot or self dot file contents dot iter uh, here we'll do fd dot let file name equals file name dot as bytes. And this will be file name dot len. FD dot write all file name dot len. You know, maybe I should just implement this in Noodle so I have my serialization of this done for me automatically. Uh, There's just so much room for mistakes here, and I, I don't don't like that. Um, yeah, I can I can go implement this in Noodle. I think statistics that's fine. We'll have to Noodle statistics. 
I guess we'll probably make a copy of these things. Ah, since this is kind of internal. I, I'm just going to finish this up. Okay, we're going to write all uh, file name. Uh, write out the file name. And then we're going to have the number of pages in there. Okay. Add bytes. S, can I, is it just bytes? I think I might need to convert it to a stir. Yeah. Aster dot unwrap. I think it's two stir, not aster. Because aster is uh, infillable. It is, okay. So then I'm gonna do if, or then I'm gonna go for, for page ID contents in file contents dot iter fd dot write all oh face cam's blocking the code <laughs> ha ah thank you I'll move that to the top right I think that makes more sense there all right there we go sorry about that Okay, all right, so now we've got the uh, file contents. Actually, I should up the font size for streaming for sure. <laughs> um, let me see what I can do. Let's, uh, okay. X term, I think it's uh, font name. Sixteen. Nope. Capital N. Oh, I might need an actual font name. What's the uh, uh, X term font name? Hmm. Okay. What's a good font? What's a good font? Nimbus Mono? I don't know if that's any good. I feel like I can do the like default uh, monospace font. Um, and then I need to do the size, man. I, I need to just make a, I'll make a, a script for this. I think I can just use the system default uh, by doing something like this. Wow, that's an ugly one. I don't know why it doesn't work in... <laughs> oh, wow. Uh, I can't... Oh, it can't load the 24 point. What's this? Does this work? Oh, that's nice. That's what I like. Uh, FG gray, BG black... Uh, we're going to write this to uh, home local bin uh, stream term dot sh. Oops. Echo bin stream term. I guess I don't want it stream term dot sh. I just want stream term. So we'll do. Mm, dot local bin stream term bin sh okay chmod plus x nice I want this command okay damn it Okay, there we go. Sorry about that. I like completely. I'm. I'm just. I always forget that uh, fonts need to be readable. Mononaki. What is this? I'll take a look. Works well. High and low resolution displays. Oh, nice. This one's actually pretty clean. I have no idea what this actually is here. 
Um, so we were in shared min repo source. Okay. There we go. That's a lot better. This font is actually gorgeous. This is a really clean looking font. <laughs> I like this quite a bit. Okay. Uh, write all file contents. We want to write out the um, fd.write all uh, file contents.len as u64.2le bytes. And then write all the page ID, which I think is a fixed page ID, is a U size, damn it. Okay, so we'll do that as a U64. And then we'll write the contents length. Then I'll write the contents. Write out the file block contents. Uh, page ID. Nice. Okay, so that's gonna write the write out the state file, write out the file contents length, write out the string length, write out the file name, write out the file contents length write out each of the contents, the page ID and the contents length, and then the contents. Then write out all the pages. So this should be easy. fd.write all self.memoryContents.len as u64.2le bytes. And for vert adder and the a uh, page in self dot memory contents dot iter fd to write all vatter and z sixty four dot two le bytes fd dot write all page question marks on all those and I think we did it we have created the world's best file format. Ah, uh, yep. Page. There you go. Um, that'll do it. Okay. Read out all the pages, so that should serialize out everything that we care about in this structure. So that will then exit. So we'll do this, uh, print successfully serialized min repro to this. Finally. There you go. Okay, uh, ASDF is 121 megs. So this will have every single page, all of the files that are touched and used and accessed um, during min repro. I'm actually kind of surprised that those file names are touched, like memory.ram, why are those in there? Oh, that's the state file, okay. Yeah, it starts off with the state file. That has what has been written to everything, okay. And then we'll just have like raw memory contents here. Obviously that's some like text section stuff. Okay, cool. So that is the entire two gig memory state plus 16 gigs of disk minimized down into 121 megs. Um, so now all we have to do is write a deserialize for that. Um, and then coming in a bit late. Could your serialization library be used here? Yes. Ah. All right, I'm going to get some water and we're going to go do this correctly. Don't let don't let me take the short way out again.
All right. <laughs> okay. Whew. Oh, I miss these headphones. So I haven't been using these headphones for a long time because the headband, uh, like the headband got like really gummy. I, I don't know why it was like some pleathery thing. And after like five years, it turned into like a gooey mess that would turn into like a oily paste on your hands and like make a mess. So I actually, I did this today. It's very fancy. Uh, I took the inner bar out of it and then I removed it and I goo gone it and then I put a sock on it. <laughs> so that's, my, that's my new headband. Um, but I, I was previously streaming. When I was streaming, I was wearing my uh, DT770s and these are fucking awesome. But the downside is streaming when you have closed ear headphones on makes it really hard to get like a normal voice because you can't hear your voice as well when you have like, it's basically like having earplugs on. Um, so I wanted to switch over to my uh, Hi-Fi Mans, which are now with a, a beautiful sock as the um, headband, uh, which actually works just fine. But these are open ear. So that makes it a lot nicer because I'm able to hear uh, what I'm saying. And it actually, like, if someone is having a conversation with me in the room, I can actually hear everything just normally. Um, and, oh, my God, the sound quality on these headphones is spot on. Okay. So Barber Shopper said something uh, along the lines of, uh, please don't be a lazy asshole and do this correctly, and why are you writing serialization stuff when you have a serialization library? And you know what? You know what, Barber Shopper? <sighs> You're totally correct. Okay, so we'll do pubstruct min repro serialize. Or we'll call this min repro file. And then we'll uh, noodle this uh, for serialize and deserialize. And then we're going to move all of the things in here that we actually want to serialize, which is just these three fields. And we'll put these up into here. I am loving this font, by the way. I don't know what font this is. It must just be a default one that ships with Debian, but I fucking love it. Uh, uh, GQ. Set uh, columns, 79. Uh, set text width, 79. GQ. Okay. Now this fit in 80 columns. And this is going to be uh, derive default. What do you guys think? Putting your document comments above or below the derives? I always like, I haven't really found like a rigid way I want to do that yet. So this is going to be um, a structure containing all of the serialized contents used during a, um, whoops, one second. I've got my Tibia guy training on the other screen. Uh, Structure containing all of the serialized contents used during a uh, min, min repro. And then here we'll have the MRF min, min repro file. And this will be uh, the raw contents of the min repro. Um, Noodle actually has gotten really fleshed out. I don't know if I've committed up to my tree recently. Um, okay, so all this shit's broken, so we'll comp this out temporarily. So, um, and file contents. Um, Murph, 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 new line. Okay, and then we should have file contents. Oh. Uh, yeah, so I actually added support for all enum types recently. It's pretty much exhaustive for all enums, and I think actually structures I finished as well. Um, so I'm actually really excited about that. So 70 min repro file type annotations. Uh, yeah, it's not happy about that because I don't have noodle brought in here. So we'll do use noodle star and then 
77. Self dot state. Murph. Murph. Okay, struct with a similar name exists, of course, and type annotations needed, no default implementation, yep, so shared memory pro cargo toml, we'll pull in a dep on noodle, which is uh, file equals noodle, uh, I think that's where it is, path. Okay, so HashMap doesn't implement Noodle, so we're going to have to implement those. Before derive, because comments visually separate derive from struct. Okay. I respect that. I actually think it, yeah, I think it does look better, actually. I think that's what I commonly do. It seems like it, I just randomly pick one depending on my mood and... How, how the day's going. Okay, so. Um, so I'm going to have to implement, I'm going to have to go into Noodle. And we're just going to have to write serialization for hash mappies and path buffies and boxed slices. In that case, it's a boxed array, which might be kind of gross. So we're going to do uh, use standard collections. Actually, we're going to do alloc. Um, we'll do alloc collections btree map. Uh, we're going to have to do std anyways for, for these. So we'll do standard collections hash map use standard path, path buff. Okay. And this is pretty easy. It's, it's basically the same thing that we did before. Um, I'm just going to try and find a good example. There's a good one. Vec is close. Okay. Implement serialize for a hash map of KV. Uh, K serialize. V serialize. And serialize the number of entries. Serialize all of the values. Self.iter uh, try for each. This will be KV. Serialize at serialize. Key followed by value. I think I can do that. I think try for each allows me to use question marks. Um, of course, and then we don't have deserialize. We'll implement that in a second. I just want to see if that builds. Uh, we'll actually go into uh, shared, Francia shared noodle cargo test. We'll try and work on this in isolation. Um, yeah, it's gonna be like this. We're gonna have to destructure like that. Okay, try, not implemented for brrp. Um, yes. Beautiful, okay, so uh, try for each. So if k and v implement serialize, then we're gonna serialize k and v. Self.error, so self.length, the length of the hash map, number of entries, and then for each field, we're gonna serialize out the key and the value. Um, does that mean Noodle would not be no standard anymore? Um, I've made the standard stuff in it so easy to just rip out. So, like, all you do is you just remove, like, a couple of these things, and then you'd remove the impulse of those, and it, it'd be fine. So, I, I'm not losing sleep over that. Like, the goal of this, uh, of Noodle is that it's simple, uh, so that you can easily change it if you need it to, to implement serialize and deserialize for whatever you want. So... Add a feature flag? Yeah, I definitely could do that. I just haven't yet. That's the correct way. Uh, hash map here. Okay. Deserialize. D 
deserialize for hash map KV, deserialize, deserialize for hash maps. Okay, that fits. Deserialize that to get the length of the hash map in, in elements. Hash map. Okay, the hash map we're going to return. Okay, and then deserialize all the components for zero dot dot <coughs> length. We will do a uh, map dot insert map this kv I made a bunch of typos deserialize equals not implemented for K oh whoa Uh, hash not implemented for K and V. Yep. Use. I don't know if that's the same hash. I'm going to use standard hash just in case. It's slightly different. Um, and then 229 equal also has to be. Okay, so we'll just do KV here now. And then we'll do, uh, we'll do a where K deserialize plus hash plus equals. And what are the constraints? It's probably slightly different. So if I look at uh, rest up doc. Um, hash map, I just need to make sure that the requirements are, uh, we want for insert KV, and then we can look at, where's the where? Where's the where clause? Do, 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 do. There we go. Uh, equal in hash, and S is build hasher. Oh, uh, that's the actual hasher. So K, K and V equal in hash. Okay. Okay, so K equal in hash. So then this one doesn't need hash. That would make no sense. Comma. K is the serialized reader. Nice. There we go. So, and I think that's correct. Okay, so k deserialize hash and equal, map insert, k deserialize, and then v deserialize for all the things in the length, and then return out the map. I, l I love this library. Like, this, this library is pretty sweet. Um... Oh, we're going to grab vex for path buff. Uh Okay, serialize the number of bytes. Let stir uh let bytes equals path buff. Uh let self dot as stir dot unwrap dot as Esther dot question mark dot in two stir dot as bytes. Honestly, I think I can just do this. Um, K 
Okay, uh, obviously there's no type anymore, and we'll comment out this deserialized temporarily. Count generics are now in? No fucking way! No fucking way, dude. Do you have the... No fucking way. Is this the tracking issue? Where's the tracking issue? Woo! Kant's generics. Cheers. Oh my god. I've been waiting for this day. My whole life. Wow. Alright, let's check it out. current state or I guess that's merged into the RFCs um, let's see okay count generics yep requires nightly two generic um, so how does this work you just give it A constant. Oh, that's interesting. Okay. With height. Wow. Wow. Does that mean I'm able to do... Um... Okay, so if I do this, if I do like struct foo, uh, derive... Default for foo u8 that. So that should fail to build. I'm not building thumb v7. Okay, yep. And then uh, feature const generics. Has that been plumbed through for drives yet? Oh, okay, so they haven't put it in default yet. They haven't added these derives yet. Um, tracking issues, this. Default for raise is not, okay. So I could at least make a, I could make my own generics with that. Okay, cool, good to know. Um, all right. Fuck yeah. Dude, that's awesome. Uh, path buff. We're going to deserialize the length. That's fine. Allocate the vector we're going to return. That's fine, I think. I think there's a path buff. And yeah, there is a god bolt for, uh, for Rust. Totally recommend it. I spend a lot of time in here. Um, it's, a, it's a great place to, to like proof of concept things out, especially if you're doing like optimizations. So, reason why there's no default for arrays is that the default for an empty array is implemented always, but cannot be implemented for TN, where T is not default. I see. That makes sense. Okay. So, what I want to do is I want to look at... Um, do, do, do. I want to look into path buff, and I want to see if I can get that from a VEC. Um, from, 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 from a RFT, from an A path buff. How is there no, 
Gotta eat some food on my tibia characters. Um, do do do. From a string, and I know I can make a string from a vector. Unless there's a function that uh, takes it. Let me take a look. I'll just search this whole thing for vec. Okay, well, since there's no vec on this page, I, I don't think that's where that's coming from. So we'll have a string here, and this we can get from a vec. And I might implement deserialize for string. Uh, string? Yes, I do. So, bu 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 bu. Um... That means for this, I actually can just do this. Serialize to string, and then down here, I'm gonna do let string is equal to uh, deserialize. Oops. Uh, deserialize, and this will take a what does it take? Uh, reader. So we're going to deserialize a string unconstrained. Yep, of course, or on, on, yeah, unconstrained, unused. Okay, some string, uh, and then this will be path uh, from string. I don't know if that's available. Expect a result from that on the here. Okay, expected two parameters to serialize. Of course, I need to pass it the writer. Uh, path buff is OS specific and cannot from vec. Or was it OS path? OS path is, is OS specific. I'm using just strings. These are basic file names as well, so I'm not too concerned about it. Um, Toaster is failable, so this would actually fail, and the serialization would fail if it cannot be serialized as a string. Um, so yeah, in theory, there are probably some paths that are not expressible in this, but for any path that anyone realistically would care about, it's expressible. So none error for this. So this is a, we'll do a map. Um, actually, we'll do an okay, I think. Uh, what is it? Um, how do you go option to error? It's uh. Uh, bup, 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 bup. It's like or error. Okay, or. Yeah, it's okay, or. Okay, or. Empties. Nice. Okay, so deserialize. We just deserialize a string and then make a path buff from it. Um, okay, so this might just work. Deserialize not implement for box. Box, 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 box. Yep. Okay. Implement serialize for box. Box T, where T implements serialize. Serialize, serialize. Ah, uh, that. Right, that's gonna deref that box. Get the internal part. Okay, uh, impl t serialize uh, deserialize for box. These document comments are kind of worthless, but whatever. Box t. Um. Well, that's kind of tough. I guess T is sized in this case. This won't work for box si slices. How would I go about making a... I guess a box slice I'd have to handle sp uh, specifically. Okay, so we got the reader. We're going to deserialize a uh, thing, and then we'll box that up. Uh, new. There's no unsafe code in here, right? Yeah, okay. 
Like I know I could I know I could use uninitialized on the box and fill it in there. Um Okay, so deserialize for box T deserialize that the writer just deref self to get the internal of the box. Serialize that out, that should be good. Deserialize for box, that's good as well. And now I just don't have serialize for um for a, a 4096 array. So you're saying I can do, um, let's try it out. So you're saying I can do, uh, I can do this. Is that the syntax? Where is that rendered? Rendered, 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 rendered. Is this the official syntax that they ended up using? Constant colon u size. Thank you. And okay, so struct is never constructed. Okay. Uh, pub fn foo. So now I just do like that. Is that what you do now? Um, or we'll make it take this as an arg. I'm guessing debug's not implemented for that. Yeah, I'll link that most. Yeah, not used. Private type in a pub, yup. Okay, so print foo. That will convert it to a slice. So we should be able to pretty print that. Really? Um. Oh my God! Thank you. Jeez. I'm struggling today. Okay, perfect. That looks great. Uh, dash O. Okay, nice. And yeah, we got the constant five. That's gorgeous. That's gorgeous. So what if I if I don't do this, then that has to be passes generic throughout the way. Um, how do I use that to? Okay, let's. Uh... Let's get that working here then, because I had some ugly ass shit before. Um, array, serialize array. Okay, so I implemented deserialize and serialize for array uh, using this table. <laughs> Feature const generics. Okay, and then we're gonna go to array. Shilai's array here. Oh, I'm so excited! This is a dream come true. Uh, const n u size. It's happening. Oh, maybe I do need that macro because I won't be able to, um, I won't be able to know how many lines to produce for this deserialize here. I would have to do unsafe code here to make it uh, deserialize into this. Yeah. Um. Ah, uh, yeah, but that has like a lot of unwind issues. Um. Uh. 
I could temporarily restrict this to things that implement copy or clone. Although, no, that's not that doesn't work for deserialization. I'm, I'm crazy. Okay, so If they implement default, it's fine cuz I can I'm going to I'm going to temporarily allow default. Thank you. A noob one sec. Thank you for following. What's up? Uh, let mute array is equal to default default n. Maybe I will do on an it. Obviously this is broken. Um, array lengths can't depend on generic Ah, uh, well, that's a pretty big usage issue. Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah, that might be a that might be a tough one there. <laughs> I don't believe this. It's right here. Update Rust? Sure. I'm probably, yeah, I'm, I was probably behind by a bit. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm off by like uh, a month, actually two months. Have, have I been on Linux for a month and a half now? Middle of this page has a solution, okay. Oh yes, an XKCD comma. Okay, middle of this. Okay, const generics. Yup, allow that. Maybe on init. What do the curly signify here? Does anyone know? Yeah, I mean, that makes sense. It's just assuming the whole thing will be on a knit. Yeah, okay. Let's see if this... Uh... Yeah, it still doesn't work. Okay, so that's fine. We'll get rid of the default constraint, and then we're going to have to do this. So we'll do... Um... What sucks is I had this library have no unsafe. But now we're going to have to have unsafe. So we're going to do... Um... This is going to be a maybe on an it containing a TN and then this will be um, uh, maybe on an it uh, I forget all the paramedoodles for this one. I don't want assume init yet because they're actually not initialized. Um, maybe on init as on init. Yep, that's what I want. Okay. Curly forces it to be constant. Okay. Okay. Nice. So we got a maybe on a knit. Then, uh, I guess I might need to do that for each individual field. Um, no, I should be able to uh, get mute. No, get mute. I can't do. I can do a uh, pointer as as mute pointer. Um. Reading from this pointer or turning it into a reference is a UB, but writing to it is not UB. So I can do that. So we'll do an asmute pointer on that. So unsafe array dot asmute pointer. This will be 
let pointer is equal to this, and then we'll do like pointer dot set, uh, pointer dot offset uh, for i i and zero dot dot n pointer offset i i dot write um, The question mark is not safe here, but uh, let's see. Serialize. As I size. Okay. Uh, get mutable access to the array. Deserialize each member or each element. Uh, that's fine. Okay, expected that, maybe on init, and then this we can do unsafe array dot assume init. Okay, um, so how do we do this safe? Uh, so I think what I'm going to do here is um, uh, let's deserialize is equal to zero. Just one. T equals deserialize, deserialize reader. Uh, if let's sum x if let sum x equals this if let sum x else or if let okay x is equal to deserialize write this in x else uh, break uh, if deserialized is not equal to n, uh, for i and zero dot dot deserialize, uh, standard bim drop, pointer dot read offset, pointer dot offset, i i as i size dot read. Actually, we can just do this, right? Drop in place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you're right. And then that takes a mutable reference, right? Yeah, a mutable pointer, so that we don't have to read it. Okay. Deserialize each element. Uh, failed to deserialize. Break out. Return error. Ah. Uh, Check if we deserialized everything. Drop things that were partially deserialized. I'll return an error. So I'm not sure if this is safe since I'm doing maybe uninit on the entire array. Um, I might have to do maybe uninit for each field because if I do it for the entire array, then I think uh, I think this is actually defined behavior here. Yeah, this is fine. I can drop in place because that's been filled in. Um, and I'm not actually calling read on that array. I'm not derefing that pointer. So that should be fine, I think. I, although that's going to deref the pointer and drop in place. Um, OK. Oh, this returns an option. OK. Return failure. Uh, oh. Okay, so we maybe uninit this guy. We then get mutable access to that array. We deserialize each element. We keep track of how many things we successfully deserialized and thus were written in. We break out if we fail to deserialize anything. If we fail to deserialize anything, then this will be true, in which case we will go through everything that we deserialized. We'll drop it in place, and then we'll return failure, and then uh, that won't return. Otherwise, we'll come through here, and we assume init. 
Thoughts? Thoughts? Incorrect closed delimiter. There we go. Okay, it builds. Okay, so do you have any other um that's really fucking cool. Um so we have this bad boy I want to get rid of. Uh allow incomplete features. Since we're using it so lightly, I think we're fine with that. Um Okay, 261. Okay, then in this, this is where it's going to get really cool. So we're going to use a buffered writer. Um, it's equal to buff writer, new file, create file name. Mute. Uh, self dot. Uh, uh, Murph dot serialize. Map error. And then here we just have to make a new error. I always forget the syntax. It's like error, new, error, kind, other, uh, failed to serialize min repro. Is it in here? Yes, it is. Nice. Okay, so serialize out the file. Okay. And that will use the buffered writer, so that will be more efficient than just like doing some crazy stuff. Okay, I'm moving some hams. I threw them on the ground. Good, okay. So, on use results, now it's a used result. Okay, uh, yeah, I guess we're technically not using writes inside of here. Uh, unnecessary unsafe block. Oh, maybe uh, this is not unsafe. Okay. Function cannot return without traversing 261. That's, um, how do I, how do I deal with a box, isn't that? Is there a way to get the like in internal thing? Oh, just as ref probably. Yeah. Okay. Okay, and then we'll do version U sixty four. And then serialize. So when we go to create a new one. I think we'll make this mutable just so we can do this. Self.murph.version equals minary pro version ID. Set the version identifier. And I think, can I, is asref, yeah, asref takes a T. I'll just do this to really strongly type that. 
Oh, unexpected type type argument. Um. Um. Maybe sudden in the constructor. I think I can do. Can I do this? Murph dot version in the constructor. The problem is I use default. I should probably just switch away from that. Um, that's yeah. Uh, actually, I need it to implement default. Unfortunately. Um, I'm just gonna keep it like this. I I unfortunately need this to use default because it's in a much larger structure that requires default. I'm fine with this because you will have exclusive access to it when you do this anyways. Um, okay. Six, okay, looks good. L slash ASDF, 121 megs. It's gonna be like the exact same format as before. Um, XXDI, SDF, Vim. I probably could have just done head, but whatever. Okay, so ACDD, okay, looks great, perfect. Um, uh, do not move this. It must be first in this structure. If this if this structure changes the should be revved. Okay, so now we have that min repro file, and now we should deserialize the min repro from a file name pub fn deserialize. Uh, IO results min repro file. Uh, let's let Murph profile P as ref path. Can deserialize assume constant version? Yes, absolutely. It's gonna it's gonna assert on the version. We don't have time to support uh, old versions, so we just don't. That's just a, a rule of our tool: is if you if you want to use an old version of something, then it is on you. Uh, to just stay on an older version of the the repo um, if you want to update to newer things. So all these things can be reconstructed by just running it through the same keyframe that you had before. Um, so everything can be reconstructed from the original snapshot deterministically. Uh, so the, we just don't have really high pressure to support old versioning. Um, it would just be a lot of legacy code and, and bloats and and restrictions from making changes that improve things because we'd be focusing on legacy support. So we're gonna avoid that. Um, so here we're going to uh, let's mute reader is equal to buff reader, new file open path. Okay, uh, create a reader. And then here I should be able to do um, min repro File deserialize from mute reader. Deserialize the file. Um, and then we just uh, OK Murph. Buff reader, we gotta scope that in. And we'll do assert Murph. Uh, actually, we'll just do if Murph version is not equal to this, return error, error, new error, kind, other, invalid, min repro file version. Ch 
check the version of them in Repro. It'll probably just fail to deserialize if the version doesn't match. Um, dot map error. Error new. Error kind. Other. Uh, failed to deserialize min repro. Uh, okay, or. not a closure. Okay. Yep, it'll incorrectly deserialize uh, before given a version error. Yep. I'm fine with that. Um, and I can do this. Perhaps the version does not match. There you go. Now it's uh, documented. <laughs> Obviously, we're not using this function yet, so it's not doing anything. OK. I want to get the crash inputs in there as well, I think. Because uh, I don't want to have to specify the the crash stuff. Um, do a lot of bad things. Okay. Uh, I'm trying to figure out how I want to handle this for the user experience. Um. Man, I forgot how good these headphones are. Holy shit, dude. Oh. The only downside is they're heavy. These these weigh like a pound. So, I actually need to like buy some foam. I'm going to make like a new headband. So, I'll probably uh I'll probably sew like a new headband so I'll get some like I don't know what I'll get. Probably like a, a I don't I don't actually know like what fabric I want to get for there. Well, I'll get some nice foam, I'll like wrap that in there, tape it in, and then sew some, um, maybe sew, god, it'd be kind of cool to make it look neat, use like a, a fun, like bright neon -y sort of like, um, thread for it, I'm not sure. What cans are these? What's up, Metaconstruct? These are, uh, Hyperman HE500s. So they're HE500s with uh, a very custom sock-based headband. So the old headband deteriorated and uh, started leaving like a residue and like crap in my hair. Um, it actually broke like very early on. The headband broke. So the headband on these is terrible. The cans are amazing quality, but the headband was trash. Uh, so I actually drilled a hole through the um, like adjuster thing here. And uh, there's like the metal bar in here, like the original me metal bar, so the shape's right. Um, so obviously they're no longer adjustable at all. Uh, I could actually slot in a groove. I could like mill out a groove in there and then that would allow me to like slide it up and down. Uh, but since I'm the only person who wears these um, and my head's probably not gonna grow anymore from this point in my life, uh, I'm fine with, with this. So <laughs> innovative, yes. Yes. <laughs> I was like, what do I have that would be like a little bit of padding on there? So I decided to go with a sock. It's not the highest quality, <laughs> but it works. And it took like 15 minutes. So, and I like wearing these open ears when I'm streaming. This, this is a much better experience than wearing the, um, than wearing the uh, DT770s. But... All right, so we just need to find a way to get that uh, file name passed in. So what I think I'm going to do is I'm going to probably overload the repro file, or the repro command. So the repro command, by default, uh, it takes a couple different arguments. So it takes the keyframe name and then the crash that you want to reproduce. Um, I could add a new 
I could add a new thing called like min repro where you do cargo run min repro, uh, which would potentially work, and then that would only take the min repro file. Um, I could maybe overload the like TKO thing. Thanks, Rose, for the follow. <laughs> yeah, get some good foods. Any anything beats chicken nuggets. <laughs> yeah, I finally got my uh, stream alerts set up. So I had them set up when I had uh, when I was running Windows, but then I switched to Linux, and my stream was kind of like not in the best shape because I didn't have the like notifications coming through. But once I finish up this task, I just need to write it up and PR it into work and let people know it exists. And then I, I can probably play some uh, Tibia if you want to do a hunt. Okay. Yeah, how do I want to do this? So I can go to shared source main. Yeah, I respect that. I'm I'm just I'm training down the road. I'm gonna try and get 83 acts today. I'm uh, let's see what I'm at. Got 57% to go. Which if I do the math on that, it takes 13 hours right now. So 7.4 hours. So I probably will get probably will get 83 today. Yeah, do I want to make a min repro? I can do a run runner. Yeah, let's do that. <laughs> We're legit the same. Oh my god. No way. <laughs> Dude, that's awesome. Yeah. I don't know. I get so sucked into training. It get, I mean, this is what I do all day. I literally just write code all day so I can easily have Tibby up on another monitor. And I'm just training. Shield is 66. No. I mean, you're a paladin. You don't really use it. You're fine. Uh, lib.rs. Okay. Repro. And let's take a look. Where are those at? RG. Uh, enum commands. Source. Call this min repro. Okay, two seventy two in non exhaustive in command. Oh, I guess I did need command. Uh, two seventy two non exhaustive. This one's gonna be really easy because there's not gonna be a config option for it. So this will just be commands. <laughs> You're talking about exercise. <laughs> yeah, Tibia that we're talking about is this game right here. So, this is where it's at. <laughs> this, this is where all the cool people hang out. It's uh, it's just like a, it's just a, a sh shitty fucking. It's basically a, a mud with a gooey. So if you actually look, so um. The game leaked, so if you look in like uh, tib theory, cats, uh, NPC, like if we look at one of the NPCs, we'll see that they call it the uh, the GI mod, the graphical interface multi-user dungeon, which goes way back to old days. It's so cool. So, but yeah, all right. You have an Iron Man character? Oh, in RuneScape. I have actually never played RuneScape. Um, how AFK are the skills in Tibia? You need to do an action like every 20 minutes. So the longest you can have food for is 20 minutes. So you at least need to eat food every 20 minutes. The higher level you are, the more mana you have and the more health you have. So the longer you can go like without spending mana or training. But I actually, I have a maker. So this is my maker character. Um... So my maker character right next to me that I'm training on is making uh, ultimate healing runes. These are what you use to like heal yourself. It's pretty much the only way to heal yourself in this game as a knight. Um, there are some other ways, but they suck. Um, so I'm just sitting here like making runes all day. 
I have like no mana. I only have 200 mana and the runes take 100 mana. So I need to use a spell every, uh, I think it's like every four and a half minutes or so. Uh, and if I had a promotion, it'd be even worse. So. But I don't know. Old, old school RuneScape would be really fun. I actually have a couple Iron Man characters in Tibia that are like self-enforced. Uh, like no trading you have to you can only use items that you loot or make yourself no makers that can feed them So like every item I have so I remember I was like level 30 and I had like a plate armor and like Some shitty studded legs or something and I also didn't allow picking stuff off the ground So like going to a, a cave and just picking up like plate legs off of a uh, dragon cave I didn't allow as well. So like everything I had to kill a monster and loot no partying i love that i i don't know why i've always enjoyed like making mini games out of games so never use rust it seems borderline unreadable the trade-offs it off i would actually say rust is a highly readable language um uh, we're kind of in the weeds here on kind of the like interface to our application uh which we just wrote uh, actually, we wrote it very early on in the project, and it, it's probably due for, like, a little bit of cleanup. Um, I don't know. I think Rust is really readable. Like, I think this is gorgeous. Um, this is one of my favorite languages. Like, I, I wrote really... I, I love my style of C. Like, if we look at my GitHub. Um, uh, oops. GitHub.com slash Labs. So I have a couple things in here that I've written in C. Almost everything now is Rust. Um, but the C that I've written, I really enjoy. So I have a kernel in here, a hypervisor in here. What did I call it? Uh, uh, that would be grilled cheese. So this is kind of like, I don't know. I, I think C is a beautiful language as well, um, but definitely not worth writing in anymore. I'm trying to think what would be my high quality code. My MM's probably better code. But like I just love I actually used all the like in and out sal annotations in my C. So first of all, helps find bugs. And second of all, it helps increase the readability, which is really nice. Um kind of just going through I, I don't know. I I loved writing C. C was the only, it was like the first language I fell in love with. And to this day, I still love the language, but man, is it impossible to write. Like, it's just, it's too hard to get right. And I don't trust myself with it anymore. <laughs> but I totally pasted just some random, random thing <laughs> as mute pointer that was in my clipboard. That's the downside to Linux is having like 50 billion clipboards. Here you go. Here's this. I hate having an X clipboard and then like a GTK or like uh, whatever they call the other clipboard. It's really annoying. Um, if I had a different terminal, I probably wouldn't have that issue. I, I know there's like some crazy ass command that you can pass to X term to have X term copy to the other clipboard instead of X clipboard. Uh, and I just haven't done that yet. So I don't, this is my gaming computer. So I don't really do any dev on here. Um, so let's see, where are we at? Uh, we're at min repro. We're adding another command and let's see what we have here. I don't think setting about, yeah. So we're going to copy one of these. So, um, this this part of the code, this like command line parsing stuff was written by uh, a new member of our team. Actually, not a new member of our team anymore. Um, and he uh, he was learning Rust right as he was writing this stuff. So there's some things like builder patterns and stuff that he's since learned. So I'm sure when he looks at this code, he's like, damn it, all these things. So we'll probably go, go through and have like a fun refactoring day on this. Um, I refactor too heavily. It makes me really hard to work with on a team because I, I refactor my code frequently like like I rewrite my entire like kernel that I use my research kernel every like three months um when I'm working on it right I haven't written a new kernel in almost a year now um ah uh, orange slice actually that was like five six months ago um 
Okay, uh, this we'll call min repro builder. And for min repro, reproduce an existing crash from a min repro file. And this will be a min repro file. And here we'll say, um, provided a min repro file, reproduce a crash. And then we just have to go to min repro. Pro builder. I think that's probably an unused arg, maybe. Cargo run uh, provided a min repro file reproduce crash. Oops, cargo run min repro. Okay, unwrap on a non value set rust or export rust back trace equals one. Okay, sweet, run runner, that's failing. That's in the uh, lib.rs, I think. So everything should be plumbed through. It can't get the keyframe name, that's fine. We're gonna have to make some of this stuff conditional. <laughs> do any dev, I just, I do internet connected dev here, because that my, that's, my, that's my offline dev box, and that's where I do like my crazy shit. That's where I do my fun, fun projects. Um, but let's see. And now I'm not going to be able to get this camera right. Son of a bitch. <laughs> okay. So now I need to make some really tough decisions, which is user, user usability. Uh, so there's a keyframe value that's always provided. So I think what I'm going to do... Um, who actually specifies where that keyframe comes from? Where are we at? I think I closed, no, I've got command open. Okay, so keyframe builder, that takes a required keyframe and a snapshot. Okay, so we're gonna make a required field for the um, min repro builder. This is gonna be the min repro file name. Min repro file name. I think there's a way to do, um, I don't know if I can do this. I don't know if I can have a space in there. We're gonna see. Min profile, perfect, I can do a space. And we'll just make that file name then. See a barber shopper? <laughs> Fun project, sell on Ode, sell on Ode for six figures? Nah. It's just, uh, this is for research. Okay, I'm resetting my lost. I stopped attacking my character on accident in my training. Okay, all right, so. Nice barbershop, regrets on the hypervisor stuff working. What do you get working today? This week. Well, I guess you're probably you're probably headed off by now. Uh, I think Barbershopper is the only person who was inspired enough by my Fulkervisor stuff to go write a hypervisor. I eventually should actually uh Is it Bruce Dang who's gonna give a hypervisor training course? Or he's like planning on giving a hypervisor training course of like developing hypervisors? Cause making hypervisors is is not, it's not exceptionally hard. It's hard, but it's, it's, I think the average systems level developer probably could write a hypervisor or be comfortable working in a hypervisor world. Um, you might notice that my code speed like dropped a lot there. Uh, that's cause I'm working on user interface stuff and I, it's, <laughs> Sometimes I struggle to motivate myself when I'm doing <laughs> user interfaces. Um, man repro. Okay, so we got run runner. That's gonna call that. Uh, and we're gonna know here in run runner here. So we're gonna say uh, we're gonna say keyframe name. Yeah, hypervisor is just a little bit higher than a kernel. It's I mean, they're pretty similar. Like, if you if you took an OS dev course in school and understood it well, 
Um, a hypervisor is really not that far of a leap. Um, if an OS dev course was your hardest course in school and you really struggled with it, then it, it might be tough. But it, a lot of things would probably come back to you. And I think one of the issues with uh, OS dev courses in, in universities is they're typically six months, one semester, what, whatever a semester is, four months. Um, and the issue with that is you, you don't really understand things until they click, until you have that like epiphany moment where everything makes sense. And it's, it's pretty rare that you get that in a semester, I would say. Um, unless you have an exceptionally good teacher, odds are you just won't get to that point. You like, you'll learn how to regurgitate things. You'll learn kind of how things are interconnected, but you will never understand like why they're that way or what decisions led up to that. Um, and that's kind of what I feel like that's the, that's the important part. And, and a lot of people leave an OS dev course or even a CS degree entirely without having that click. Um, and that, that really sucks. Like, I, I don't know the solution to that. That's a really hard problem. So here we'll say if uh, command is equal to commands min repro else. And we'll just do this. And here we'll call this min repro file. file name. And I, I don't know if uh, partial EQ and EQ are set on that structure. It looks like they are. So, okay, so this will now have ASDF. Okay, so we're getting an unwrap failure, uh, which is good. That's going to be some arguments that we don't specify. Probably uh, one of these things, set client mode, server is some. That's fine. That's... Uh, Run runner, uh, two nine, two nine, load keyframe. So load keyframe is failing. Okay, awesome. So that's getting plumbed through. So what then I want to do is where I go to load keyframe. This should be in run runner. Uh, I want to specify the keyframe name. I think what I might do is I might take, I might make load keyframe take a an enum that could be either a keyframe file name or maybe a server name or a min repro name because I, I don't like having this set server. I We have too many state machines in this code base now and it's starting to really hurt. Um, it's really starting to hurt the end users. The end users are starting to complain about um, Something's not working the same way in different modes. And that's just because we have state machines that are kind of handwritten in a couple places. And that leads to situations where something works in one spot in one mode and doesn't work in a similar way in another mode. And we really need to kind of uh, fix that. Okay. So load keyframe. So somehow I need to let load keyframe know. Um, so like here's my thought process in my head. And, and this is what I do when I'm developing. So uh, w when I'm passing this to load keyframe, I have a keyframe, potentially a server, which currently I have as a different function. So a keyframe name or I'm in repro file name. And there are a couple different options I can do. One is I can have keyframes and min repros have a similar header such that they can auto detect based on the type of file of what to load. Two, I could have load keyframe take two arguments, both as options, and then I could have it just pass in the correct option in the right spot. Three, I could pass in an enum that would tell it the correct type. I think the enum makes the most sense because if you have two arguments and one is always none, it's an either or, um, and enum makes a lot more sense. So I think I might change that. Let me go see where uh, load keyframe is used. And we'll search for an RG on a dot on a load keyframe here. And it looks like uh, we use it in some unit tests. And we use it in here. Q load keyframe, that's fine. Actually, um, that dot's not getting. Uh, maybe I don't want to do slash dot. <sighs> there we go. Um, okay, so it looks like we only use it in one, two spots. So I think we should be fine with making that into an enum. It's not going to be a huge pain. 
for uh, kind of our code base. So we'll go into shared libtko source. And here we're going to make a, and that's on load keyframe. So let's take a look at how we're going to work into this process. So this is going to get the memory backing, and that's, um, yep. And then here we're going to mux off of the memory backing types. That will cause us to behave differently if we're in server mode or if we're in local mode. That's going to set the extensions for these things. I think we save the keyframe name, which uh, I'm actually going to need to serialize that as part of the... Yeah, I'm going to need to serialize that as part of the structure. Um, so the keyframe name is something I'm... Basically, everything that's loaded about a keyframe and load keyframe, we're going to need to provide in our... In in our main repro. <laughs> For the love of God, just put control W O. Did that move them all to like separate windows? I never use windows in Vim. Who uses windows in Vim? Or did that close everything but just this? The problem is I like to have the other ones open. Now they're in separate buffers. You think I know how to get those buffers back? You think I'm some Vim pro? Beanie. Is that the next one? I, mm, I don't know. I'm guessing it's like B1, B2, B3. Yeah. Okay. Is there like a, is there a, a key that I can press? Can I do like a B2? Is there like a fast way to switch windows? LS to get a list of buffers. Okay, that's cool. I'm not used to it. Normally I just use multiple monitors. So on stream I have like, I don't know how to work on one monitor effectively. So that probably shows in my uh, setup. Okay. Yeah, so the problem is we have stuff like this. Does it do partial? Can I do stuff like this? Nmap uh, control tab. Um, so the problem with Rust is having like all the librs's uh, makes it kind of hard. So I mean, that's actually pretty nice. I, I, I could get used to this if I just do it better. Uh, LS. Actually, do these change order? No. B7. Okay. Um, load keyframe. Uh, so, we're going to go to... Hmm. Does that control tab, does the CR allow you to like hit a number? I would really like to have like one key and then hit a number and then go to that. And then this would be pretty usable. Kind of like my window manager. Um. Okay, so let's see what we're gonna need. Path, where's path that used? Save off the first keyframe we load. If it's none, if the path is sum, attempted to load original keyframe without a keyframe, of course. Path unwrap new. So maybe we won't need that keyframe name. Then we can see, based on the memory backing type, path into pen mem and states. Or is it currently panicking? Panicking at 2929. Okay, right here. Yep, it can't make that because I have an else. Um, yeah. MFN, keyframe name. Yeah, we saved the keyframe name there. I think we have to get the keyframe name and the serialized uh, state buffer. And then that's it. 
and then I think we're good. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna deserialize that bad boy. So yeah, we're gonna make this a um. This will be a keyframe type. All right. Pub enum keyframe type uh, local. This will be a path. I guess I could template that to have an as ref. Uh, where p is as ref path. I think you can do this in a in an enum. I actually haven't done this. Min repro. I think we'll stylize it like that. Uh, different types of keyframes. Okay. Good. Two eight nine three. Expected a type argument for this path, and then this will take the p as ref path. All right, and then we'll do this. I think this is how I want to format this function. Tab that in. There's no neat way to map key num to things QCR. Okay, that kind of sucks. Uh... Seventeen ninety one. Did I like nuke a line somewhere? I nuked something. Oh, path here. <laughs> That's kind of an obscure, uh, obscure errors there. It's kind of what I expected. Um, path into, of course. That's not going to work. Else, if if let some path equals path uh, elf elf local oh yep we need this uh, keyframe type Okay, keyframe name doesn't have a size known at compile time for stir. I see. So path into path into. Really? Oh, um, because we have an else by. Chill is buff. Two nine seven one doesn't have a state. I'm going to size none of while time. Uh, what do I do? Path, 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 path. State of N. Keyframe name X. Keyframe name is. Oh, we've got some weird bounds. Expected an option. Uh, two nine six. Oh, I think I might want to put the option on the inside. That's the current way I have this structured. Um, is that if you pass none? Kind of gross. Uh, I guess min repro won't have an option. That'll make sense. Okay, fled some. If that's some path, okay, here, keyframe local path, and here that will take a keyframe type. 
2898. Ooh. Save the first keyframe we load. Original keyframe is equal to path unwrap in two. If let sum, if let, this one will want it to be sum. So this one will do if let keyframe type local sum path equals path. Oh, I, there we go. Every time we watch someone write Rust, it seems like they're fighting the compiler. Good, they should be. The compiler should be fighting you. Shouldn't just let you do things that are unsafe. I think that's a really, I think that's a terrible mindset that a lot of people have going uh, into Rust, or they're like, man, the compiler is so much harder to use than C++. Of course, because C++ and C let you do whatever you want. Um, it's, that's like saying, it's, it's like, it's really easy to build a plane if it doesn't have to fly. Yeah, no shit. <laughs> uh, replace some path with path. Um, yeah, I've, I've got I've to fix up a bunch. I'm just not thinking about it right now. Like, uh, okay, so in this case, we do want, here we do want if some path, and then down here, this one I think is fine. Um, I mean, it's obviously not. Uh, 2898. Oh, up here? Oh, keyframe type. K, okay. Keyframe type. That I want to unwrap because I want to get the sum. And then here, I want that to panic. I guess, th is that just going to always going to, that's always going to panic. I might want to put this on the inside. I Yeah, I think I do want to do that. Um, if let sum path equals path this otherwise it, yeah it's, otherwise it's gonna unconditionally panic in like every situation okay yeah thanks Desi. you're paying you're paying more attention than i am okay then this needs a uh as ref dot into i think is gonna do the trick there And this is what I'm talking about with state machines by having like a bunch of things on the inside that are like, um, that are none in some cases and some in other cases. I really don't like it. I would love to refactor a lot of this stuff. Hey, Buff Seagull, thanks for the sub. Thank you so much. You know this file needs to split up in, <laughs> needs to be split up into multiple files when it's, uh, <laughs> when it's, uh, <laughs> Over 3,000 lines of code. That's actually like 4,000 lines of code. It's, it's basically AFL now. Um, keyframe type local. Okay. My leg just fell asleep. I'm hurting here. Um... Got my prints wrong here. Map. Load keyframe. There we go. Okay, 2898. That needs to be a ref. Uh, 478. Oops, that is in source lib.rs. Okay, 478, load keyframe. Yep, now this is where we want to be. This is getting really gross.
Uh, keep them type. Okay, it looks cool. Use libtko. I think that was a capital A. Or 78. If it's min repro, then we will do a uh, keyframe type. We might have lifetime issues here. Um, keyframe type min repro. I'm trying to think. I could do this with like an if inside of the match. I think this is actually easier to read, unfortunately. Uh, we might have lifetime issues. 100. 5 on 5. Wait, what? Oh, unexpected close. Okay, uh, I did something stupid here. If this, that matches, that matches. Too many here. This one's fine, okay, yeah. Load keyframe, then cargo toml. Turn off debug so we have a, a or turn off optimization so we have a better stack trace. Okay. Two nine seventy. That makes sense. Oh, we're oh we're hitting our panic, aren't we? Yeah, we totally are. We're hitting bye. Bye. Okay. Else else if uh unexpected um, keyframe type. It's an exhaustive if. If let uh, keyframe type min repro min repro file name is equal to path print min repro of this we'll call this fn. Um, that makes sense. Yeah. So here we have to do, I think we have to return, we have to return the keyframe name, which is, um, I think we will have to get that from the min repro. There's going to be some weird state things with things like doing time travel debugging in uh, with the min repro. <sighs> time travel debugging. I'm going to need to be able to switch dynamically between all three, all three of these modes between min repro and the keyframing stuff. Um, min repro, I think, will invoke from the command line every time. I don't think we're going to have a way to jump back to him in repro. Maybe we will. We could potentially support that. Uh, and then if we want to have a keyframe file name supported, what do we want to do for that? I don't know what we want to report for the keyframe file name. We might just, uh, I might just say this is min repro and just hack it. Um, and then the next thing I have to return is the content. So what we'll do is let min repro is equal to min repro deserialize min repro fn dot azref. I expect failed to deserialize min repro file. Print deserialize min repro file. And then uh, we'll just panic here. Two ninety one. Keyframe doesn't have a uh, known size. I think I need to do azref dot into up here. Oh wait, what? Min repro. There we go. Nice. Really.
Really? Shouldn't we be hitting that panic? Are we crashing and... Shared. Well, that's impossible. Um... Is the, are the arrays not working? Are the const, uh, const things not working? I mean, it looks like they're deser uh, they're serializing correctly, but are they, oh, I gave it ASDF, which is a, f uh, ASDF does exist. Yeah. I mean, it shouldn't crash when it deserializes, regardless of what it's doing. Um, args, uh, targets. Debug, TKO, fuzz, min repro. Stack exhaustion. Stack exhaustion on T deserialization. Okay. Okay, it's not a real fucking crash. I was like, holy shit, how did I, how did I crash? <sighs> okay, so we're gonna hop over into TN, deserialize. Okay, we make it maybe on init. Then we're going to go through each element, and we're going to call deserialize on... It should be on T's. Is it for some reason deserializing on non-T? Um, let's see what it's deserializing. It should be, because it's doing a write, and the write is to an element of pointer, which should be a TN. And T implements deserialize. Why would that have recursion? Type. Uh, any. There's a type name somewhere, right? Where's the name at? Any type name. Type name, colon, colon, type, okay. Uh, this is standard any type name of I'm just curious what that type is I have no idea how that's recursing it's T semi n what do you mean oh This. Yeah. Ah, oh, shit. How am I going to do that? Um, the deserialize is called on TN. I mean, this is this is wrong, right here. This needs to be a mute t, um, and that needs to be a 
Line 324 is effectively... It shouldn't be, though. Why, why would it be that? Because it's writing X, and X would only work... Oh, yeah, 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 because this was wrong. Yeah, that makes sense, because this is wrong. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, okay, that makes sense now. Okay, the crash makes sense, and then that was also a, a, a pretty catastrophic bug. This one's fine now. This one's simpler, so that one's fine. Um, this one, I need to I need to convert a TN to a, a pointer. Um, well, I have a mute pointer to it. That's a TN. I don't know if this is safe by derefing that. Like, is it safe to do that? Is it safe to deref that array? Like, I think this will be correct, but I, I still don't know if this will be okay. Um, this will be slow as shit without optimization. Because that will deref that pointer and then as mute pointer on that. I can just cast the pointer. Yeah, that's probably better. As mute pointer, as mute t. Okay. Uh, deserialize min profile. Done. So then here, I want to return a uh, min repro. Yeah, that was a big oof there. Big oof. Uh, repro dot. Um, ooh. State. What did I call it? State. State. Oh yeah, that's gonna deserialize the Minery Pro file. Um, yeah, that makes sense. So I need to wrap that up in a Minery Pro. If there's a min repro, set the state to that. So now I need to figure out where to put the min repro. I can put the min repro in the min repro slot, but then that needs to have a state machine to determine if it's in the record mode or in play mode. Um, and I can do that. That's not too difficult. Um, so here, we're going to make this return a min repro. And then we'll do um, let mute mr is min repro new or default mr dot mrf equals mrf mr wrap up the murf min repro file in a min repro. Okay, so what else do we have here? Version state. So here we'll have a record. Uh, determines if this is in record or replay mode. We're going to make a getter for that. Pub fn record mode. Um, in record mode. Self bool self dot record. Uh, determines if we're in record mode or in replay mode. Okay, then down here, this will say mr.record mode. Actually, we're going to do the opposite. We're going to say replay mode. Replay in replay. Replay. There we go. If we're in the replay mode, then here we'll say in replay is equal to true. And then since this is internal to here, no one else can set that. Okay, so that can only it can only ever be in replay mode if it's been deserialized. Uh, Two nine one nine. 
Um, okay, that's fine. 2919. Expected because of that. Expected a vec. Dot into. Doesn't have a known size at compile time. Uh, if and else have incompatible types. Uh, okay. Dot into. Nice. Okay, we're almost there. So that's going to set that up. That's going to get the serialized state right. TKO version doesn't match what box reported. Uh, from sync, that's because it's uh, loading in zero. So it is actually starting to go. Um, here we're going to say if the... Um, here we're actually going to do uh, self.persist.min repro dot borrow mute is equal to sum min repro yeah this could be a lot cleaner um, but min repro we don't really care about the perf on that's getting moved um, so we don't want to clone min repro but we will clone the state uh, to vec into vec Establish the min repro. Uh, to vec. Okay, so that's going to set that as the min repro state. That should be good. Uh, page got double reported to log page. Perfect. Okay, so then here we're going to say if min repro dot. Um, if it's not in, what do we call that function? In replay mode. If it's not in replay mode, then we're going to establish the state. Min repro clone. That's fine. Track min repro. That's fine. Notify min repro about this page. So here we'll say if not min repro dot in replay mode. If it's not in replay mode, then we log the page. Okay. Good. And then min repro here. This stuff's fine. Okay. Um, RG min repro. Okay, crash handler is the only place. Um, actually, we want minery pro dot Unix MU. There we go. Log file contents. Oh, look at that. Passed me was nice and put it in one nice spot. Fun fact, slice as pointer is self as constant t as const t. Oh, cool. Huh. I guess that makes sense. If not min repro dot in replay mode. If it's not in replay mode, then we record the file contents. Okay. Okay, and then we do the borrow mute. That will cause it to update all of them, right? Dot star equals min repro. Or dot star min repro. Uh, yep, so that will assign it. That will update the reference that is passed in the diff reader, so the diff readers will be ready to read those files. Okay, so that means I should be able to go into... Um, ba -ba 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 Tico version doesn't match what box reported when trying to sync from VM to box. Okay. That's fine because the page in handler is super wrong. So this, we're going to get the page in handler here. We're going to say get the memory backing. Um, we're going to need to make a new memory backing type. Uh, this is going to be a um, 
memory backing type. This is going to be instead, we're going to have min repro rc ref cell min repro. And there might be an option on that too. Well, this one it won't be optional. Uh, I will have to be because it's an RC. Has to match the same type. Uh, contains the min repro file, which has been deserialized, and contains only the pages and files that or file contents that are used during this fuzz case. So what is min repro? So min repro is for us when we're doing some fuzzing. So we found like a crash in an application and we have a whole VM. So we have like two gigs of memory up to whatever. You could have 32 gigs of memory and 64 gigs of disk. And what we're doing is we're implementing it such that we detect all of the memory um, and disk state that is used during a fuzz case to reproduce a crash. And then we're only going to actually store the information that is used during that fuzz case. So if you have 100 gigs of disk and memory and all this state that you're tracking, um, instead, we'll end up with having a um, couple hundred megs of what's only touched during that crash. So it's a way to allow system crashes to be given to developers in an easy way without having massive amounts of files. Everything will be nice and self-contained in one file. That's the goal. Um, so it's about to start running here in a second. Uh, so min repro here, panic, min repro not handled. Okay, so we should get these panics. Oh, no, we won't, because we don't set up this memory backing type. Uh, I'm just looking for a reference of where we do this, where we assign it, that looks good. Down here, we're going to say uh, memory backing is equal to min repro of a self.persist.minrepro.clone. Okay. Um, set up the memory backing to point to the min repro. Okay. So now we have a memory backing that's backed by the min repro file. So we should get a panic here from min repro not handled. Perfect. Okay, so here, now I can say, um, actually be relatively straightforward, hopefully. So, yeah, maybe. Um, we'll implement get page, pub fn get page, self vatter usize. Uh, U8 4096 uh, requests the contents of a page based on a page aligned vatter. Assert vatter and OX FFF is equal to zero. Uh, page pass to get page was not page aligned. And then self.pages.get vatter. I think this is an option. Technically, that's a box uh, pages, self.murf. Dot, I, I don't even know if I call it pages. I think I call it um, file content or memory contents. Yep. Memory contents on virtual address. That needs to be a reference. And that's going to be unhappy because it's a, a reference to a box. But that's actually fine. In fact, we're going to unwrap that box. Uh, I'm going to keep the box. I think I'm fine with that. OK. So that's going to look up a page. So uh, min repro.get page. Uh, if let sum page is equal to min repro.get page, batter and not OXFFF. Then page, else, uh, and that we can just deref. Uh, otherwise, panic page for vatter not found in min repro. Vatter. Method not found. Hmm. 
for RC, oh yeah. Um, let min repro equals min repro dot borrow mute. Hopefully it's fine with that shadowing there. We don't even need to borrow mute, just borrow spine here. Okay, and then uh, dot as ref dot unwrap. That will get rid of the option. We need to borrow this separately. Let min repro. We'll call this mr min repro mr. Match terms have incompatible types. Found a box. Um, DRF, DRF. Okay. That works. Isn't that cool? Isn't that fucking cool? Unhandled SIG set accessing that. Oh, it's because it reserialized it. Yeah. Okay. So we're going to have to reconstruct this. I can't remember where we had this. This one. Shared. Ah, uh, crack, crack. Boop, 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 boop. Plugins. Uh, if we're not in min repro dot in replay mode, if we're not in replay mode, then we want to serialize it out. Successfully serialized. Now we should be able to min repro that. Six F. How did it run longer the first time? Panic twice. Page for that. Not fun in min repro. Is that the stack? Mm, I don't think that should be right. Because I think we log. I'm pretty sure I log the pages. Yeah, I log all pages that are paged in. So we shouldn't get page faults. It should behave the same. Like something has got paged in. I don't think we hit our crash yet. Nothing should have changed on disk. Technically, we're not reading from the, the disk contents in the min repro, but that's f that should be fine for now. It's, it's obviously not right long term, but. So, like this time, it's working fine. Okay. I handled six of. E six one five three eight. E six one five three eight.
That's different. How's that getting different things? How is that? Uh, how's that possible? Where's the stack being allocated? It might be like stack related. Shared to give a uh, uh, hmm. One D five E eight. One D five E eight. D five E eight. One, two, three, four, two. Okay, so that's different. What is going on? Borrow mute. If it's not in replay mode, then log the page. That should pay that should log everything that we ever use. Print paged in X Vatter and not oh, except that. Oh, uh, it doesn't take quite. Okay, t page in dot txt. We're just gonna run this a couple times and see if it's the same on both. It should be. For some reason, it's not. Uh, since I have the prints in here, these are not going to match up perfectly. Okay, that's really weird. How is that possible? How does that... How did it page in a couple more pages? Um, oh, maybe it's, it's coverage. Is it coverage? Is it the, um, uh, it's the, is it I count? No, it's, I have, I have these like jittering, I count breakpoints, and I think there's a chance that I look at memory. If I take a peek at memory in them, then that's going to cause issues. Stats, I counts, enable guest profiling. Time travel. Huh. Where did I put that? Uh, jitter. Stats jitter. Enable guest profiling. False. Okay. That makes sense because that would look up things in the process in different orders and in different processes. I think that's it. That should be the only non-deterministic thing. 
Maybe. <laughs> yeah, it's running a lot longer now. Page in for this couldn't be found in min repo. I think that's fine. Cargo run min repro ASDF. Um, did we hit the crash? Oh, it doesn't know where the I count breakpoint is. Okay, I think we're good now. Um, so now I just need to do the same thing as repro. So if we take a look at what repro does, source command. Let's take a look at repro. That takes the file name. That's going to do that. Okay lib.rs repro if it's in repro mode then set repro to that and that's it okay so then for repro Crash file, that's going to load up all those different things, latch the input, set up that, set up the I count breakpoint. Is that set up the I count? Yeah, it is. Uh, wait, does it? I count breakpoint. Uh, inject. On inject, if there's an I count, then we register it. Okay, so all I have to do here is I need to do this same logic. Uh, I need the input file, seed file, I count file, and the I count in the min repro. Um, and really all that matters is that I, I need to latch the current input. I need to latch input. And I need to set up the self persist repro. So I count is easy, seed index is easy, seeds is easy. Um, name is easy. Okay. Noob question, uh, where would you recommend an undergraduate in CS start if they wanted to learn fuzzing? Um, honestly, they're like, I would, it, it's really hard. Actually, learning fuzzing is pretty difficult because even CTFs don't really help with fuzzing because CTFs are too short. CTFs go too fast. Um, there's really like finding bugs in CTFs is really never part of that challenge. Um, there aren't many good resources for learning fuzzing. I would pick up AFL and pick some random target, not a hard target, not something that like you've ever heard of. Like go into the Debian repo and look for just some random project written in C or C++ and try to fuzz it and, and find what it takes as an input and uh, generate a corpus for that. So find inputs that are valid for that application. So if the application takes some PDFs, find some PDFs and then run them through AFL. And then what I would try to do is try to do that um, by not using AFL. Try to get similar results for yourself by writing your own mutator where you like jam these inputs together, try and corrupt things. Um, but yeah, I would start with something open source, something simple, something that hasn't been audited and security doesn't matter because if security matters in it, um, it's likely already been audited at least to like an AFL level. Um, maybe subcomponents haven't been fuzzed with AFL, but usually at a high level, pretty much any like any PNG parser you'll ever find or any any like basic parsers have already been fuzzed with AFL to some extent. Okay. So actually I need to have the um 
I need to quickly change diff reader before I forget. So this isn't shared Unix mu source diff reader. And in here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to see if log file read. So if it's min repro, that's on read. So anywhere that a log file read occurs, we need to potentially do a min repro. Thanks, man. No problem. Okay, log file read. So that already has been gated by in replay mode. And then what I want to do is that's on read file. So if there's a block in changes, otherwise if otherwise if let if let some if there is a min repro in do I have frantic access here? I should have self.min repro. If self.min repro dot borrow mute. I could do this, I think. Can I destructure a ref mute? Maybe not, probably not, that wouldn't make sense. Um, let min repro equals self dot min repro dot borrow mute. Get access to the min repro. Okay, log file read in these two spots in here. We're gonna get access to the min repro. If if there's min repro, um, if that, I also need to say, if some true is equal to map x dot, x dot in, what did I want? In replay mode. If it's in replay mode, print or panic file read and replay. Um, as ref dot map. Ooh, where? 344. Yep, here we just do this. Okay, so we should maybe get a panic. What is this is? This isn't right, or this isn't read. If if we're in replay mode, file read for replay. Okay. Then down here in right, this is same thing. File write and replay. Uh, get access to the main repro, standard mem drop. Okay. I think this fuzz case is supposed to read and write from min repro. So I'm kind of confused there. Log file read. Print LFR. Yeah, that's a problem. 
So that means that means that min repro is fault. Uh, none. Okay, min repro. Um, that is some. I think for some reason that's none. Yeah. Um, that would make sense on deserialize here. Because that doesn't have access to min repro. That's on Unix. Is it? Deserialize here. Deserialize on a diff reader. That takes them in repro. That must mean that in Unix state. And here, I probably. Deserialize. Where is it? Diff reader deserialize self min repro clone. Okay, so that means that the self on on this okay. I think new. This takes them in repro. No. no. I'll create a default one. If if let's on um, min repro fn set min repro on there. If there's a min repro fn track min repro, uh, in which case, I see. So it starts off as default, which is a none, and then this will come through and set it if and only if it's in min repro when a frenzy is created. So in this, yeah, okay. Uh, source lib.rs. So this in what we need to do is up here. Uh, else if commands in repro. If this, then some min repro. Otherwise, if the command, oops. Otherwise, if the command is a min repro, then we always want to set the min repro mode, which will then set that as the like min repro file. And this, yes, file read and replay. Okay. Okay. File read and replay. Play. Okay. So this one, all I need to do is I need to do the same behavior. So buff, buff off to copy. So zero out the buffer now. This could be paged out. Okay. So I need a way of reading that. Log file read. read what is this buff we're gonna copy from the part of the file that exists you know the buffer now it could be paged out um buff off to copy i see so that zeroes it out ahead of time so i think what i want to do is i want to pad this out I need to pad out the block size with zeros if it doesn't exist. That's going to read to that location. Okay, I think this is fine. So we can do zero out that. Then we'll do a um, this. 
bread. Make sure two copies equal to that. All good. Follow doesn't exist on my TKO server. Okay. Do you follow a design pattern or just code and then go back? Reorganize as needed. Oh, I, I always just, I pretty much always just code and reorganize. Design patterns are really tough. Um, it's hard to know how to write things ahead of time. Okay, this is what I want. I want this. Yeah. This, and then we'll do min repro. Dot as ref dot unwrap, which is safe. Um, <coughs> then we want to read buff buff off into copy. Unwrap. And then here we'll do uh, read file. <coughs> yep, that's not in min repro, of course. Share min repro source slib. This will be very similar to read page, get page. Uh, request the contents of a file with file name. Okay, at offsets. File name, stir. Uh, offset U size. Ooh, request the contents of a file with file name and offset. I think I need to request the contents of a block. I don't know what block sizes are in my min repro, so block ID. And then this will return an option, ref u8, I think. We'll see. We'll see where that goes. This will be file contents.get stir, oops, file name. File name dot map x, x dot get block ID. Uh, yep, this will be read file, read block, call it read block. Down here we'll call read block. Uh, Self.file name zero for now, it's wrong. We actually know the block ID, so that's easy. Nice, 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 block ID. 167. Oh, in this one. Do I storm his path buffs? Son of a bitch. Okay, so that means I can do this as a P, as ref, P, as ref path. We'll do this. Okay, 168. Uh, expected U8 got an option option. Ooh, 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 there's a way to do this, and, I think it's and. Um, I think it might be like and, and then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's gonna get the option from the first one and then invoke, it, invoke this closure on the second one. That now is a vec u8, which is easy, done. Expected a U8 found. Expected a uh, expected slice U8. Can 
not index a type of use size. What? What are file contents? Yeah, hash map of hash map. So we'll have get p, uh, read block, file contents. So we'll get it by the file. And then on x, which is the inside, if and only if it exists, then we'll go on to the inside. And then we'll do x.get. Oh, whoops. And we can do this instead as slice. Uh, and then x, x dot s slice. There we go. That'll basically do all the lookups through the table. Try using expected a sum. Does that have to be a sum at that point? That makes no sense to me. I don't think that's right. And then, I probably should do this. Uh, and then, then we get this, and then we slice that, if it exists. Um. Found reference U8. Maybe I have to do this? I thought and then would keep it all within the options. Okay. Okay. 356 on this. Oh, that's on diff reader. My bad. And just a reference instead. Okay. So I'll get the slice of that file. Block. And then here we'll do um, buff. Buff off, buff off, plus two copy. Dot copy from slice, block, block off. Plus two copy. So then what we'll do uh, is we'll copy into the buffer from the block, from the offset, uh, block offset, yep, offset mod block size. Okay. Uh, buff off. So we zeroed out for the entire range, and then, ooh, if let some block, because this is available. If let some block this, then we're going to copy into it, else, um, panic read unexpected block from repo file. Uh, this will be file name and then the block, we'll do self.file name and then block ID. This might fail because we need to handle, um, if it reads out of bounds, I think, uh, slice, yep, slice out of bounds for length that size. Okay, so then this, uh, to copy here will be the um, let block copy is equal to standard compare min between two copy, which is the size we want to copy, and then the size of the block, which will be block.len. Because it's possible that the block is undersized, in which case this will be block copy. We already zeroed out above. So we zero out, so if it's reading kind of like out of bounds of a file, reading past the end of a file, it will return zeros. Um, oh, this is probably failing in another spot. Uh, bu 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 359. No, it isn't. Um, buff plus the smaller between two copy, which is the block remain and remain. Then we're going to copy. We're going to request that block. We're going to zero it out. That's fine. Then we're going to get the block, read the block, get the smaller size between block.len and to copy. Then we're going to slice block by block off and, oh, um, 
uh, I need to subtract off the offset here. Uh, so I can do block len dot saturating sub. Saturating sub of the block off. So that will get the number of bytes to copy. Minus the block offset, so the offset offset that we're into the block. Okay. Really? What the fuck? Um. So block is valid for block dot line dot saturating sub. Block off. Block copy. I don't understand how that's possible. Index ten twenty four out of range at. What? 360. Somehow, block. We have block, we have block len. So the length of the block, saturating sub, the block offset that we want to read from. That makes no sense. And we use block copy minus block off. And that's what we're slicing it by. That one's fine. That's always going to be smaller. That's all. That number's always going to be smaller than what it was up here when it was safe as to copy. So then this block dot len saturating sub the offset that we want to read from. That's the number of remaining bytes in the block. Oh, um, I need to have this uh, if it's greater than zero, because it's still slicing it even in the zero case. In the zero case, it's still slicing it, which is out of bounds. You fucker. Um, okay. Already mutably borrowed. Min repro. Where? 1658 in the page in the handler. Um, ooh. I have to first zero it out before I borrow it. And the reason for that is because it could be paged out, what we're reading into, what we're about to write into. That's pretty gnarly. So that will make sure it's paged in prior to actually getting that borrow. So now it shouldn't, it, it's seriously like we're writing an operating system in this, uh, <laughs> in user land. Some of these things get pretty complicated pretty fast. Um, okay, page for that not found in min repro. Buff off plus da da buff off to copy. In this case, we replace it entirely. In this case, we get the remaining number of bytes left in the block after block offset. Then we copy that many bytes, if and only if there's something to copy. Otherwise, we have an unexpected read. Okay. Then down here. Okay, we didn't have any page in file rates. So why are we hitting this now? What's causing this to occur? I feel like I shouldn't be reading out of bounds of a block. I might want to overread the file. Buff off. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's wrong. Okay, nice. Nice, 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 nice. So, for each, we zero it out. In this case, we copy it from the block internally. That's fine. This one is also correct. 
Then this one, I want to actually read and populate the block. Um, what's the block? Okay, so block off, yeah. I want to read the full block. Log file read. Yeah, the problem is we're actually reading at the offset already, directly into the correct location from the file. Um, I need to read the block. I'm, I'm logging that as the block ID, which makes no sense. Um, buff off. So I think I need to issue a read at the the block offset. So if I do block ID times times the block size, okay. So we're gonna get the block ID, we're gonna multiply it by block size, we're gonna convert it to U64, we're gonna then read it into let mute block OU8 block size. We're gonna read into block. Okay. Um. Shit. Read a file from the server. We give it the offset. We read the whole block. We get the bytes read. How do I want to handle this? I'm actually fine if the bread doesn't match. If let some bread. I don't care if it's truncated. Log file read. Block ID buff. Or block. Okay. So if it's exceeded, then that's good. Drop the server. And then here we're gonna do log file read block ID. We're gonna log this block, which is correct. And now I have to populate the buffer. Buff, buff off dot dot buff off plus block copy. Um, this is actually to copy, which is always gonna be present now. Dot copy from slice block block off block off plus two copy. So we read the whole thing. Uh, copy the contents into the buffer. So get the buff off plus uh, to the buff off plus two copy. It should be the same as, as this line. Block, block off plus two copy. Good, okay. Sweet, okay, so then this one, this min repro, this is just gonna be uh, this because the blocks will always be block size now in the file. So that will panic if for some reason the file's corrupted, which is fine. So buff off plus two copy, yep. And then we'll have to regenerate that, of course, and we have to fix this up in three other places now. <laughs> so down here, we're gonna do a read, read exact. Um, into block, log file read of block, and then we'll copy it in. Okay, so we get the block and then we slice it up. So now we read the entire block every time. That is a lot better. Okay, now we just have issues on the, um, we have issues on the right side of things. So this, it's going to read a block. In this case, it's reading the whole block size. Um, block, I don't think that needs to be a vector. 
Oh, yeah, it does, because I end up inserting it. So then that, I do the copy. There, I do the log file read. That one's actually correct. So here, I give the off. Oh, that's not correct. That's really not correct. OK, so this is going to be the block ID times block size. That was a bug before this stuff, too. So that was an issue. OK, cool. Nice to know. So get the file, read the file, get the block ID times the block size. That's going to be the offset. Read that into the block. Then we copy from buff off, uh, copy into the block, copy the buffer because we're doing a write. I was reading the wrong location of the original file. That was pretty broken. OK, now in this case, in the this case, I want to, once again, this is wrong as well. Um, block ID times block size. So we want to seek to the block ID that we're currently reading. Then we log that block ID in the block. Uh, block ID. Good to know. All right, we fixed a, we fixed a bug that probably was pretty, pretty wrong in our Unix emulator. OK. Uh, crashes star. Remove those crashes. OK, and now cargo run starts uh, snap. OK, so let's look at offsets. Offset is now only used for computing those. Oh, whoa, what's this? What the hell is this? Can we fix these? Block, block size. Yep, this is wrong. OK. OK, offset should only be used. So pass to read, do a saturating sub to get the number of bytes. Uh, here we're going to div mod, then we update that. Here we do it as well. Offset checked add. This, OK. Nice. OK, fd.seek should only do this in two places in this file. Good, we do. And it's block ID times the block size. We're reading the entire block. Uh, then we're logging that as the block ID, and then we're uh, changing, in this case, we're reading into the buffer from the block offset to copy. Good. In this case, we are doing the same thing, block ID times block size. Okay, looks good. And block to copy should be, yep, the remainder. Okay, log file read. In this case, we're now always reading a full block. Which means we should be able to do this now. I need to get uh, this one. So now we have different crashes. Boy, that was like really bugged. I'm really surprised no one ran into that. That was unbelievably broken. It was like just reading from the wrong offsets in files, which means any like reads from disk were, were corrupted. Um, that. So uh, yeah, I don't know how that didn't get hit by others. That's kind of strange. Min repro ASDF, okay, nice. Going just fine, going just fine. Uh, ended up hitting a sig uh, file right in a replay. Perfect. Okay, so we just have to implement that support as well. So we will go into. It'll look very similar to this. Oops. So the very first time we read, yep. Uh, we still need the min repro, okay. And then here, we'll just get the block. Min repro, min repro dot read. What do we call it? What 
What do we call our read function? It's not in replay mode. If it is in replay mode, then we're going to go into here. We're going to call read block. Okay. Nice. Okay, write unexpected block min reprofile this. Okay, we're gonna read a block. We're gonna get the block rather than copy. Uh, in this case, we need let me block is vec u8, ou8 block size. Uh, block red. Actually, this should be fine. We can just do this. Let block. Honestly, this makes more sense. Let let block is equal to this. Ugh. Then we update that, and this should be mutable. We might need to clone it. Uh, block. Oh, now it does fit in one line. Boom. Just barely. Uh, yep. Two vec. So read that, copy over it, and we should be good. Okay. So now that should be, if we're in replay mode, then that will read from there. Okay, page for Vatter not found in min repro. That might be fine because we might have hit our might have hit our crash. So now we need to serialize out the input that caused the crash. So we need to. Um, oop! I need to organize my house a second. I got to get my extra hams. I'm running out of hams. Okay, I gotta I gotta find where I put my food. <laughs> Let's see. Ah, uh, maybe it's this one. No, maybe it's ah, it's this one. I think. Nope. Son of a bitch. Ah, uh, decorations. Ah, uh, there we go. Hams, 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 hams. Hams, hams. Damn it, where? <laughs> it might be in here. <laughs> uh, where are my hams at? I forgot. Rose organized my house and made it pretty, and now I forgot where my hams are. Um. Oh, ah, uh, nope. <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> Where'd they go? Where'd they go? I checked all these. Oh, are they in this? No. Are they hiding? Are they hiding? Oh, there's a bag under it. Yep, there, there they are. <laughs> there we go. I'm gonna put this bag here. There we go. All right, I got my hams. <laughs> I didn't see the bag in the doorway. Okay. So I think this is probably working now. We just don't have the crash uh, triggering this anymore. So we need to have the um, set crash, uh, set repro. 
So we need set repro, that takes input file, seed file, I count file, and I count. Um, I'm pretty sure I can just, I can probably serialize repro. Um, noodle. I think everything in here I already know how to serialize, so we should be good. And now that should be serializable. Uh, clean debug. Okay, something in here doesn't like. Uh, oop, unused dot comment. That might be it. Maybe not. Noodle. Oh, nice. Okay, use. Uh, SP shared libtiko cargo. Serialize, not implemented for that tuple-y thingy. That's fine, we can probably change that up to not be a tuple. Um, uh, seeds. We'll call this, yeah, seed. And I think I have noodle support for names uh, tuples. So that will be a seed now. I need a semi. Okay, seeds. One, seven, two, seven. Come on. Yes. Okay, so now I can serialize out the repro. So all I'm going to do is once set repro happens, I'm going to do that on the min repro. So min repro, this will have the um, I guess I might move this structure definition to min repro. Uh, repro, min repro. Okay, min repro, we can now take this. Okay, pub, 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 pub. Okay, seed. Yep, that makes sense. Okay, repro is private. Nice. Um, oh, and libtko, someone's pulling that in from crash handler, okay. So that is now gonna take a dep on use min repro. Actually, I can take a libtko dep on, yeah, I can, I can, I can, I can go the other way. This is fine, this is fine, I shouldn't have changed it. I already probably have TKO in here. Okay. Okay, so min repro will fill the build. Oh, doesn't? Oh, because I don't have, yeah, I'm not using repro. Okay, so repro uh, input for repro. Reducing the crash. Okay, and then this we want default. And then we'll pull in use lib tko repro. Cool. Cargo toml. 
s noodle lib tko g oh, okay yeah i can't take that dip can i that's what i thought okay yeah i kind of expected that that's fine we can go we can go back to what we had not happy about it I mean, honestly, anything to get rid of code in libtko, because that's way too bloated at this point. Um, circular depth, shared bin repo, cargo toml. Yeah, I knew that was going to be a circular depth. I thought about it, then I forgot about it, and then I thought about it. <laughs> okay, so here we'll go grab from min repro, we'll grab repro and seed. Okay, these are all private. We need to update these to not be private like we did before. Everything in here can be public. Nothing in here is... Nothing in here is a big issue. Okay, noodle unused. Yep, that makes sense. So now we can get rid of that dep lib tko cargo toml noodle okay and then that min repro dep will want to take that over to sh plugins plugins crash handler source lib uh, cargo.toml okay nice oh that's a circular dep too isn't it do I depend on circular, or do I depend on? Uh, I'm. I hope min repro doesn't pull in crash handler. It does not. Oh, thank God. <laughs> yeah. Otherwise, I'd have to make another uh, empty crate, kind of. Okay. Woo! We're there. Okay, Phil, did you serialize min repro? Of course, because we changed the format, didn't we? So we need to now have this repro. We need a way of setting this uh, repro structure. Uh, we don't need diff reader anymore. Min repro, so um, in here, we put the repro file in min repro file. We have repro. So I want to set that. Um, when I produce it, I think, yeah, I think I want to, yeah, I'll do it when the min repro is created. Um, here, self.mrf.repro is equal to re repro. Okay. Now that it expects a parameter, and I think I have access to that in here. Uh, I have it in inject. Ooh, I don't have it in when we go to serialize. I think I can get it from TKO. Get access to the non-mutable repro information. Okay. So we'll do frantia dot. Uh, repro case. Okay, so that will get the repro. Expected repro found an option. Dot unwrap. Uh, as ref. Um, nope, unwrap's fine here. Okay. So that will now serialize out the reason why we crashed. So we just have to regenerate the min repro, and then that should now have the input, the file, the memory. This might be uh, this might be it. Maybe. There you go. Serialized. Min repro. I don't set the repro file yet. Okay. One seven five five. One seven five five. 
What did it hit before? I count. Okay. We're pretty close. Uh, set repro. Yeah, set repro. That takes a crash file. Um, this is going to be set repro file. And then we're going to have set repro. Pub fn set repro. That will take a mutable reference to self. Uh, repro. This will be a repro. This will call self set repro with this. Is there a way to like, I know you can do percent to go to the matching parenthesis, but is there a way to like visual copy? Oh, that totally fucking just works. Okay. <laughs> okay, set repro this. Uh, repro, repro, repro. Actually, this will take an option. Set up repro state. Um, set the internal repro state to a repro structure. Set repro there. This. libctko3014 what 4358 3814 there's delete like a random code somewhere oh paren here or not paren uh curly there mismatch types yep we want to sum Okay, so then in lib.rs, we need to go to 407. This now needs to take a set repro file. Done. Okay, so now we have a set repro and a set repro file. That means when we go to deserialize the um, uh, here, we'll do. self dot set repro state dot uh, min repro dot repro sum and that will be cloned okay so we don't have a repro of course Pub fn repro self repro self dot mrf dot repro get the repro state for reproducing the crash okay so that will load up the repro file set a repro icon breakpoint at that instruction. So hit icon break point popping into the debugger, and then we immediately crash right afterwards. That makes sense because we don't have, um, it makes sense that we hit that because we've continued past execution at this point. Um, awesome. Otherwise, print all done, um, or like, shit, what do I want to do here? I need to like stop execution. I don't want to panic because I want pops into the debugger, min repro print. Uh, min repro has reached the end of allowed states. Execution from here may result in a uh, execution from here may result in missing pages okay because in theory i want people to be able to try to continue something because if you don't touch any new memory for a while you're fine so min repro has reached the end of allowed state execution from here may result in missing pages okay export rust backtrace 
actually unset is it unset or is it on export uh, unexpect well all right i think on set works fine so now i'll repro this and we should get that print which is a, a good warning for end users and then we'll get the panic that will be pretty obvious that we ran out of pages and hopefully the user story is pretty solid here okay um hit icon breakpoint popping into debugger Ooh. If min repro, if we're not in replay mode, then we save it. Okay, there's a chance that breaking into the debugger touches memory. Okay. No, that shouldn't be the case. Debugger break. Expected icon none. Hit icon breakpoint. We're not replay. Okay, prints. Done with debugger. I think there's a chance that that's doing some like Windows enlightenment stuff in there. That I I don't know why that wouldn't be paged in because we do that on the case that we read it. Okay, done with debugger. Then we go into here. If we're not in replay mode, otherwise we go down here. Where's that getting paged in? Francis.min repro. Yeah, that gets access to that. That's fine. Get mutable access. If we're not in replay mode, then we serialize it. Otherwise, how are we not hitting that print? How are we not hitting that print? I. What's our stack like? Maybe. Um. Should be fine on our stack, I think. Should we swap back to the normal stack? Are we on the guest stack? I don't know, done with debugger, print no min repro. Or I should do it on the other, okay, no min repro, okay. Does it think we're in replay mode? Not in replay mode? What? Oh, I didn't put a new line on it, and then it panicked, and then it didn't get flushed to screen. <laughs> Woo! It was probably in there. Maybe it was on the same line, and I just didn't see it. Yeah, there it is. Okay, min repro has it reached the end of allowed state. Execution from here may result in missing pages. Then we get a panic due to a missing page. I think I'm fine with that. I think that is totally acceptable. So we save, we save all memory, we save all file disk operations, we save all, um, I need to fix up some of these git things. I don't know why brawler, Both brawler SDF shared mem RM those dot dots R uh, get status. I guess I can commit it. Git commit am um min repro should be complete. Git push. Get that pushed up. Okay, so then Uh, get status. I just need to remove these. This is some cargo dot lock rf dot sprawler inputs target Those are from a test. I don't think those will get set up. Okay, get log. Okay, that should be good. 
Okay, so now I need to do a get checkout master, get pull, get checkout noodle update, get merge master. Fuck. Ah. <laughs> ha! Start. Exe name. Okay. That should be fine, right? Oh, orgs as well. The fuck? So, I mean, it should just be this. Looks like start was changed. Okay. Got a merge conflict in Fran and shared source lib. Add breakpoints. What the fuck get? Uh, thank you for the follow. Hell yeah. CM four ninety three. What's up? So this is kind of tough. I changed the behavior of these breakpoints uh, pretty significantly. Um, and then it looks like some changes were made for the EPT stuff. Um, Um, is that really it for those? Okay. Fuck. Uh, so we got to do, if that, breakpoints. Oh, this merge, like, really broke this stuff. So I don't think I use breakpoints anymore. Do I? Head, self breakpoints, linear address. Push the linear address. How did I develop this? Um, maps the breakpoint address. Requested number of requesters. That references then The index in the breakpoints array. Breakpoint refs get the breakpoint. Okay, if it's one, then it's the first instance, push it. Otherwise, go through here. Okay. Remove breakpoint. I don't like how that's based on the current one. Um, I don't want the... Oh, I wasn't... Holy shit. I haven't been training for the past, like, hour. I haven't been clicked on my character. That sucks. Um, okay. Now I'm training. It's like, no wonder I wasn't running out of health. 
Okay, so... It's the same... So mine... This is for adding a breakpoint. All I need to do is I need to get the EPTP. That's it. And then head's gonna win. And then for removing, same thing. Okay, if x is not equal to EPTP, this. Oops, card on. Linear address, expected U64 fund U size. Okay. I guess that has changed to use U64s now. Okay. Uh, EPTP uh, linear address or insert zero. Get the refs. 272, this, same thing. Okay. Nice. So get the EPTP. Look that up. If the uh, if the breakpoint doesn't exist, I'll just decrement the ref count. If it decremented to zero, retain only ones that are not equal to that. If we're adding one, get it. Look up the entry. Otherwise, insert zero. Update the ref count. If the ref count is one for the first time, add it to the breakpoint list. Whew. Okay. Nice. Uh, shared noodle source. Uh, yeah, we're just gonna do a git checkout shared. Can't I do this? Um, I wanna check out from uh, head this. Okay, son of a bitch. Good, just add them. Easy merge, easiest merge of my life. TKO source lib. I just keep uh, ooh, guest oath type. Repro still should be in here. Is it not? Oh yeah, that's gone. Uh, three, six, nine, six, eight. One eight e plugins kdnet debugger oops lib uh, source lib uh oh uh oh
Overwrite the kernel, KDDB. Get the KD Enlightenment. Shit, we got a bunch of stuff, don't we? Oh, God. Next, okay, debugger break. Did I rename it? Oh, Jesus. Nine twenty five. Gotta be caps. Okay, good. Forty four, five sixty six. There we go. KSRS. How did that change? Okay, that could probably changed. Uh, stream term. Oh. Actually, we'll send that to four. We'll send this to four. And plugins, ah, uh, KDNet source lib. Uh, I guess I can diff, get diff uh, head, and get diff you can do on a file, right? How do you do the version? Get diff master. Uh, I don't think this is right. Uh, plugins. K 
kdnet source lib. Okay. That's the difference, I think so. Oh, son of a bitch. Oh, fuck. Who's committing with CRLFs? I technically want to look the other way. Um, does R reverse it? No. What? Really? Cap R? Okay, so host ports. I think handle break, debugger break, store KDC, handle break point. Right, the kernel debugger block. Get Kitty Enlightenment. I feel like that has been improved. Get Kitty Enlightenment and um. So I remove those. Right, cont context on break. Because I put that somewhere else, didn't I? Put that right macro somewhere else, I think. Yeah, I think so. Um, host ports. Yeah. Kitty connections. Why is it Kitty Connections now? So host sports. All right, I'm gonna assume the head one is probably. Um, I'm gonna guess that the head one is pr uh, the master one is get checkout. Um, Master plugins KD net source. I made some like pretty big improvements to it um, to reduce some like code duplication. But the master one has features, and I'm gonna opt for features and bug fixes over code cleanup. Okay. So, and we'll figure that out later. We can we can do code cleanup uh, later, but I'm guessing that those were actually things that have been fixed. 788, K bug check two address, SU64. Car on start. 
Arm crashes, star, carrier on starts. Snap. Uh, get merge master. What are you talking about? Get status. Um, okay. Not stage for commit. Unmerge, okay. Ah, yeah, yeah. Get commit. And merge with master. Get merge master. Get status. Get checkout master. Get checkout. Uh, get pull. Noodle updates. Cargo. Ah, uh, get status. Okay. Cargo clean. Uh, cargo run update. Okay. Uh, get checkout, ma uh, log master. Get checkout. Uh, get a car run update. LS fake pest car on keyframe. Snap, snap. Uh, cargo run start snap. Nice. Okay, page faults. More page faults. Okay. Cargo run repro. This dash dash creates min repro test min. Uh, I need to give it a keyframe name for this. Uh, snap. Turn repro. The keyframe. Snap. Crash here. Oh, crashes. Okay. Create min re repro, test min. Successfully serialized to test min. Test min, 92 megs. Cargo run. Uh, min repro, test min. Fuck yeah. Okay, so now the real test is going to be um, uh, stream term. So make their test. So now I'm going to do a copy of TKO Fuzz Franzia min test. Test min. And I'm going to copy Franzia uh, target debug TKO Fuzz. So I'm gonna run it in this folder. TKO fuzz, min repro. So it has no access to the snapshot or anything because it's in a different relative directory. Uh, we're gonna give it min repro of uh, test min. God, please fucking work. Fuck, uh, filled open diff reader file. Okay, um, I don't handle opens in my That makes sense. It, it tried to open it before. I think we're still fine. We just need the opens to... Yeah. Okay. Vim shared Unix state, or Unix MU diff reader. Ah. Almost there. Okay. All right. Uh, filled to open diff reader file. Two spots. Read uh, if the server is none and it's disk backed and the file is none. Okay, that's true. Um, 
and that is the same thing okay so we have the same fix for both um here's what we're gonna do uh how do opens work actually how do i implement opens uh shared unix mu source lib uh open uh let's see open let's just call open that's gonna do read c string that's gonna go through diff reader new okay That's going to file as ref if the if there is a server connected. Okay, so you basically need to handle the file opening case. Um, okay, so if it's in server mode, it hits the server. Otherwise, it hits local mode. If it's in replay mode from a min repro, then we need to check if the file exists in the min repro. If it doesn't, then we don't know that it exists, and then we'll want to return a failure. Um, where else do we do like file open here? Diff reader, non path. If not create, okay. Otherwise. Compute host path. If it is a file, so if there is a server, then do all that shit. Otherwise, we're gonna fall through here and we're gonna do a file open. So anywhere that a file open occurs, we need to get rid of. And it's just read, write, and open. Okay, perfect. So here what I can do is let min repro equal uh, mr is equal to min repro. We'll scope this. Get borrow mute. If mr dot is sum, do we want to get access to that min repro? I think we do. If let sum mr equals mr. Uh, it doesn't need to be mutable. So if we can get access to the min repro, okay, cool, perfect. Then we're gonna go into shared min repros. This here we'll say log file contents log page uh, read block. Here we're gonna have um, check uh, check if check if we know that a file exists. Check file. Okay, this will return a bool, and then this will be self.mrf.filecontents.get file name dot as ref dot is is some. Okay. Um then here we'll say if mr.check file name on file return um actually it would mm, not necessarily okay so check file name else return there we go no such file Okay, then in this case, we want to return a uh, OK on a diff reader. Uh, we want to handle creates as well, because creates, I guess a create, we would know that the file exists potentially. <sighs> Compute host path. There we go. I think we're gonna do it down here. If the host path is a file, then if it's not create, or if, if it is not a file, then if we're not creating it, then it's a failure. Otherwise, create a new empty file. I'm fine with that. That's what I want here. Uh, 
Um, I guess I don't. No such file. I think that's. I think I need to get the metadata for these files then. Post file name none, file name path, file size is zero. If check file name, I might need to serialize the file size in them in repro. Because if I don't have that, then I might not have an ability to, um, special I don't need, file I don't need, file name I, I do need, but I have it, host file name, File size. <sighs> Create a new empty file. Special file. Host file name. Min repro. Host file name I won't have, changes I won't have, disbacked is false. Do I want to allow creating a file? I think I need to handle creating a file because I wouldn't have that in my min repro database. I could log the original file lengths and then I could have a lookup from the Files to their file links, and then on creation, I could log those, and then that would handle if it's in server mode. And here, you get the file size, return that out. So at the end of this new function, I could potentially log all the information I need to rehandle new. Um, and that would be... Changes, I think I need the length. I think that's all I need. I think if I have the length, then I am fine. We're gonna try it. We're gonna try it. I need to get some runes. Might need to get some blank runes here soon. I'm running low. That might be my last one, yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, create a new empty file. That is, we'll say if check file name, else if create. If it's create, then it's new. Because we don't know about it. Else this. Create a new empty file if create, otherwise failure. So if we could not check, okay, so then check file name. This will have the lengths of the files, I guess. I guess a new file, will a new file ever get created? That's yeah, possible. It's unlikely, but theoretically possible. Like it will never happen in box, but if I use this for a different thing, I might want to support that. So, if let sum file size is equal to check file name. Otherwise, we don't know the existing file size, in which case we want to create a new file with a file name, and it's not server is server. Okay. Otherwise, we're gonna go here. Otherwise, we're gonna return one this one is gonna have file size. This back false changes none. Okay. 
check file name. If so, get the original file length. U64 on that, and then here we'll do file contents. Um, file sizes. Hash map path buff U64. Mapping of file names to their original file sizes. Is that going to work? Why is it opening HDA for a new... Fill to open diff reader file. It does need to know the size. File sizes. But wouldn't that, shouldn't HDA already be opened? Like why is that reopening it? I don't know what is causing that to reopen that file. Um, SC read write. Oh, oh, um, yeah, I don't think I need this. I should only, I should. Okay. Okay, so on, we're hitting that due to uh, an open in read write, not in a new. Fill to open diff reader file. In which case, it's just this. All we need to do is if let um, min repro, uh, self dump min repro dot borrow dot uh, is what is it? Replay mode? Is it replay mode? Replay mode is equal to this dot. Okay. <laughs> Get reset again. Okay, so in replay mode, and yep, this is going to be a uh, map x. As ref check if we're in min repro replay mode. Thank you for the follow, by the way. I, I don't have my I need to have my Twitch alerts up so I can see who followed, but thank you. One second. Um Streamlabs. Okay. If mode is not equal to sum true and there we go. It's handled on the FN read case, now in the write case. We can do the same thing. Special file writes if this, then we'll do if replay mode is not equal to sum true. Then we'll try to reopen the file. Okay, good. Okay, and then we'll do this in uh, new here. Uh, assert replay mode is not equal to some true. Cannot uh, create open new file in replay mode. In min repro, ah, min repro replay mode. Assert that that is not equal to some true. Uh, and that's just this. Okay, so now I can take. I can copy this, and now we can see if we can run it in this isolated environment. 
And it looks like we can. We got a page fault there. And we hit R. Please tell me we hit it. Hit icon breakpoint. Min repo reached end. Execution may result. We got crashes. That reproduced all the crashes that we got. Uh, that looks like it's at feature parity. So let's try it again. Git status, git commit, and fixed opening of files, which were um, fixed opening of files during uh, repro uh, replay mode. Git push. Okay. So cargo clean, cargo run, uh, cargo run. Yep, let's just see if everything looks good. Okay, cargo run, main repro, or cargo run update. Let's make sure, well, we don't have, yeah, that commit version. Cargo run uh, keyframe, snap, snap. We didn't really touch any of this code, so this shouldn't be affected. Just making sure the whole, like, chain works. Cargo run, uh, cargo run, RM crashes, star, cargo run, start. Okay. Cargo run, start. Mm, snap. Okay, we'll grab the NCA this time. Cargo run repro, snap, file name, crashes. Okay, so that should repro, and then we'll do create min repro, min rip. Rep LSLH, 120 megs, min rep, uh, min repro, min rep. Okay, I think this is good now. Looks good. Hit icon breakpoint. Okay, so that did work. Um, and then time travel debugging. Is that going to work? Uh, Q load, uh, load keyframe. Ease, shared lib tko source. I think when we do a Q load keyframe, uh, when we hit a Q load keyframe, I think I need to turn off Oh, this is where the state machine's brutal. Keyload keyframe. So if I tried to jump to an I count, that's not gonna work because we're in, in replay mode. I think what I want to do is when a keyframe is queued for loading. So no one should really call load keyframe. Um, key load keyframe, when things go through here, jump I count, that should go through and find the requested I count, find the nearest thing. Uh, Q jump PC, that's going to do a PC jump. Q jump I count, which is going to do this. Jump back and time that, find the nearest one. True. Requested I count. And then that's going to find the keyframe that that belongs to. And we'll look call Q on that one. 
Jump eye count. Jump eye count is going to call deserialize directly. Everything has to go through deserialize. Deserialize, keyframe name, state file. How do I get time travel on this? I think that's going to be a thing for another day. XD asks, if you were to make an OS for a specific game like Witcher 3, how much faster would it run? Um, it really wouldn't run much faster because it's already compiled for a target operating system. So if it's built for like Windows, which is Witcher 3 is, um, it's going to use all of the APIs of Windows. Uh, emulating all of those, you would basically have to re-implement Windows almost, uh, first of all, which is almost impossible. And second of all, would be riddled with, with, with bugs because it'd be really hard to get that implementation correct. Um, I would say the maximum speed up you'd possibly get in like a game like that, probably, f probably less than 5%. Like even if you did all the work, um, you're not bottlenecking too much on the kernel. You're bottlenecking more on like rendering and graphics sort of things. Obviously, some things might be inefficient in the kernel, but... Um, rendering is where most of your CPU time is spent, like looking at objects, and you can't speed up anything. You can't speed up anything that an application does if it's not going to the operating system by writing a new operating system. Um, so there's not a huge amount that could be gained there. Um, but for like gathering more introspection or or doing things along those lines, uh, there's a lot that could possibly be gained there. So, okay, let's see uh, min repro. I need to make sure this can take the args that you need. So if I go to min repro, this needs to take the same stuff as repro does. So repro takes in options, shared mem, quiet, crash. Okay. And repro builder. Okay. This. Verbose and quiet. Uh, disable recoverage. Uh, yeah, that doesn't matter in repro mode. It shouldn't. I guess technically, maybe someone would use it. Okay, so crash, we don't need. Keyframe, we don't need. Um, options, we have that. Shared mem, uh, we won't have shared mem, quiet and verbose, disable recoverage. Okay, so we should have command parity now. Car run min repro. Okay, and I should be able to say min rep. Okay, that should work. And then I should be able to do like KDNet one, two, three, four, five. Uh, KDNet um, con is equal to this. So is this, this? No. Is this connection? Fill the handle argument connection. Um. I, I run into this issue every time. I think it's just a space, that's why. Yeah. Okay. So it looks like KDNet got that. It's trying to connect to that um, server. It's obviously not gonna find it. Um, okay, awesome. So git status, git commit, am added command parity with repro. Push, okay. Cool. All right, well, I'm going to take a, a quick break uh, from this. Uh, I'm going to basically end up, I'm going to write up uh, what's changed. I'm going to inform the team that this is going in. We're going to do a pull request.
that's going to get shipped up, and then um, I'll be back in like 30 minutes, probably 40 minutes, and I'm going to probably play some tibia. We'll see if uh, we'll see if Rose wants to do some hunting. So, all right. I will see y'all in a, in a bit if you come back. See you around.